I have started the stream. I think it I think it redirects them. I'm not positive though. I've never done it. <laughs> yeah, I'm nothing's two. Oh, right. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> mm. Oh, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. That's clever. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm... Okay, they can't hear you, so I have to fix my OBS settings to pass this through. Okay, now they should be able to hear you. Uh, okay, I'm speaking. And then you're chewing and going to fool them into thinking you're speaking, and even though you're not. Is it working? Is chat waiting, happening? Waiting for them to. Waiting for them to. The stupid Twitch delay. Have Have we come up with a language policy for this? Uh, this little show of ours. Uh, I swear. Fuck it then. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, so. Uh, for everybody out there, uh, hi, welcome to our quote-unquote podcast. It's going to be super informal, um, so fuck it. Um, this is a t total technical nightmare. Your uh, my stream is my my camera is really shitty because it's uh, I'm capturing my thumbnail from Hangouts. Um, and because I don't know how to get Hangouts to work, we spend a little time on it and fuck it. Um, you know, the main point of this is the audio, not the video. So, um, and I never look at my camera anyway, right? And so it's all, none of us ever look at our cameras. So it's just all dumb anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about programming and game development. And I'm not the host. It's, I mean, I am the Twitch, technically, the, the Twitch host or the OBS host, but it's just both of us. There's no power structure here. That's your cue to speak, Sean. Oh, shit. Uh... It's just, this is good because we can both call each other Sean and there's no confusion, unlike when we were with Abner and he kept saying Sean. Right, right. This is much better than that. Um yeah, so how do you want to start? Do you want to just... Because we have the list of things that people were... Yeah, I want to start with a topic that you have a lot to say about and I don't have a lot to say about, and that way I can walk out and uh, and I'll be listening, but I won't be talking uh, uh, so, I can, so I can get my lunch. Um, okay. <laughs> so the thing that somebody said on Twitter, and I'm just going to quote it word for word, and I didn't write down the names, fuck you. Um, Recently, Jonathan Blow ranted on graphics being broken. What would a solution look like? And you said oh, you had, you said there's too much to say, so we don't have to, I, and I don't really have an opinion, but I'll probably have an opinion on your opinion. So just, you know, throw some stuff out. Right. I mean, like, it's a really not, like, there's way too much to say, right? But So let me see. Um, where to start with how are graphics broken? What would be a solution? A solution would be like a lot of people float the idea of, or a lot of people explicitly say that um, <clears throat> a consistent um, like ISA for all video cards that would just solve it, right? Like if all GPUs were running on an agreed upon ISA, that would solve everything. <clears throat> I don't think it would solve everything. I don't think it would. Be, I don't think that's a bad idea necessarily, but like I don't think that's happening. All right, let, um, me, let me let me interrupt and expand on that for the audience, just because we're going to get a mix of people with different skill levels and stuff, I think. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. But so basic issue is that graphics APIs are trying to wrap a really complicated problem. Um, and the complicated problem that they're trying to wrap is that, you know, there's this pipeline, and this is classically more true. There's this pipeline, there's a rasterizer, there's all this 
uh, what else is there besides the rasterizer? Um, texture fetch. Texture fetch. Rasterizer. There's all this stuff that the cache, and they're just trying to hide that all and give you something to program in that's the same across everything. And nobody's really ever tried to do that level of portability across heterogeneous platforms to that level. We have lots of languages that are portable, but they are all exposing the same sort of Van Neumann machine like um, idea. Like we figured out how to do that. The level of abstraction what we're talking about in graphics APIs are hiding this sort of very radically different kinds of of um, graphics architecture implementing these, the pipeline. Now, as we've gone to programmability, the stuff has converged a lot more. You can... Uh, it, it, when the shader is programmable, you can write in a language and it can translate it to multiple different, you know, the, in the same way we have the, the PowerPC and the x86 and the ARM, and they can all run the same high-level code. They compile to different low-level code. The same way you can, you can do that in the shaders, and that's mostly fine. Like, they'll be, the shader, inter, the internals of the computer hardware have some way to express that stuff. And so the shaders being expressible... Um, is maybe not actually the hard part of the problem because the we've that is a solved problem. I mean, it's annoying because you have to send bytecode. Like it's a solved problem for Java. For everything else, we compile natively. So your C program has to be compiled separately on ARM and x86 and PowerPC to be able to be run. But uh, Java has this idea of a bytecode that gets downloaded to all those architectures and compiled on the fly. And that's sort of what we're doing with the shader bytecodes. And so. My version of your argument then is that the single fixed ISA solves that part of the problem, but that's not even a problem that we necessarily need to solve. That's not necessarily where the pain of the graphics API comes from. So right, now which back, is why I was, which is I was agreeing with that. I was okay, saying, yeah, like, yeah. I just want to look. I want everyone to know. I want everyone to know what we meant by that. So that's okay. All. And now I'm going back to my lunch. All right. So yeah, like people want why they want a, a standard ISA. It's like so okay fine you can do that right but that, who cares that's not that's not really a big deal and i don't think graphics vendors are going to go for it there's very almost everything else has converged to though i mean as far as i know and but like there's like tiled and non-tiled memory and stuff like that but it's it's pretty much converged and all of those like differences can be attributed in the same way that <clears throat> um you know, how a, a cache on one particular Intel CPU is going to be different than maybe an AMD CPU or something like that. But they're all, and there's going to be little differences like that, but we still program to the same thing. So I don't think that the video, that the, the difference in video card or, or, or GPUs hardware implementation of things is actually different enough to even really worry about it in that regard. The tiled and non-tiled, remember, like the difference between all mobile, like if you treat all mobile GPUs as one thing and all like desktop GPUs, and console GPUs, as, as that, that's a group, and then mobile GPUs are a different group. Those two groups, I think, are quite different from each other in a lot of regards, but the variation of uh, GPUs in each group is not as big as uh, it used to be, at least. So a, a shared, like a standard ISA, eh, not, I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem um, is just the APIs are really bad um open gl in 1995 or 1990 yeah 94 95 whenever it came out was actually quite good and um it was quite good because it sort of abstracted what the hardware silicon graphics hardware or software renderers were capable of at the time and it did a very good job extract uh, abstracting that right I, is this open gl or iris gl or well they're the same thing right were they? I I don't know how different or similar they were. Were they actually the I, same? I, as far as I know, they're the same because OpenGL, okay. the original OpenGL spec, was by SGI. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, so I, I I'm just going to assume that I'm using them interchangeably, basically. Okay, sure. Um, somebody in know. chat, somebody in chat will correct us if we're wrong. So that's actually when I first started programming at all was in like '94. So, um, yeah, my knowledge of history back then, I wasn't around like doing anything serious back then so um yeah like i think that uh i think open job was very very good uh to solve the problem at the time uh it's evolved into a 
it's disastrous. Um, but its evolution, its evolution has had very good things about its evolution. Like, there are very good aspects about its evolution and very bad aspects about its evolution. But it clearly needs to be replaced. And it seems that the companies or the people who are interested in replacing it don't have the same commitment as OpenGL had, or at least the same idea that SGI had when doing OpenGL of what is what are we trying to do and let's minimally let's do the minimum number of steps to abstract the current rendering hardware or rendering hardware in general that's going to be around for 10 or 20 years and make an API based on that. Um, the console APIs I think are actually are quite okay. I've heard that Apple's API metal uh, is it metal or mantle? Whichever one is Apple's, I can't remember between Apple and AMD. I heard the um, Apple one is quite good, but I haven't used it. Um, but like Vulkan is is um, it's just it doesn't all of, you could pro- I could probably come up with what an API would be for a modern graphics API. It would be like eight function calls and fifteen hundred enums, and that would be it, right? There would be like free memory. Allocate memory, create. Well, I wouldn't even necessarily create a command buffer. Just free memory and allocate memory, and that alloc. Well, no, because there would be oh, CPU. Okay, so there'd be like allocate GPU memory, free GPU memory, uh, create command buffer, push thing onto command buffer, like push a command onto command buffer with some number of parameters, and then like execute command buffer, and like that would be almost all you need for a modern graphics API, right? But that's not what... That's not, like, the approach that graphics people are taking. And the whole idea behind modern, like, DX12 and Vulkan is um, minimal driver overhead, right? But they're making the exact same mistakes that OpenGL made. They're they're making these assumptions on, like, render passes and how memory is worked at, or how, how graphics memory works right now, how different things, like, how we batch together state changes and things like that. We're, there's a ton of assumptions that are being made uh, in the modern in the modern Vulcan in particular about current hardware and expecting that to be the same for a long period of time. They're making the exact same mistakes that OpenGL made. And I think it's I think it's quite disastrous. And I, I don't know what the answer of what would a well what would a solution look like is exactly what I described. A really, really lean API that just exposes alloc and ma- or malloc and free on GPU memory and like execute these commands. And that would be basically it. Um now, maybe there would have to be an agreed upon thing at the hardware level about how memory gets virtualized, uh, which is kind of only important on PCs because of um, like multitasking. But if you could be like at the start of the thing, at your start of your app, you say, "How much GPU memory is there? Give me this much, right? Out like like reserve this much, and then you can commit later to it or whatever, and then other apps could be paged out by the driver, and that would be like the the only overhead that the driver would have would be um, paging uh, committed and uncommitted or committed versus reserved memory on, for the current process. That would be basically the only job of the driver in that case. And I think it would make everything much simpler. We would have much clearer performance characteristics. Everything would be a lot easier to debug. Drivers would be much smaller, much simpler. They couldn't fuck around and put little optimizations in there to give them a higher benchmark score on one particular game. It would just be, everything would be really really lean easy to program for and if one video card happens to do one particular thing better than another video card then you could just say if you're running on this code path do this like you do that all the time right you have a a ldr pass an hdr pass a 16-bit hdr pass a 32-bit you have all of these things are like what kind of options do you want you have to program that anyway so you might as well like just allow the programmer to program for different, slightly different characteristics of um, uh, a video card performance, and and all that's going to happen is those are going to converge too because everybody's work. Everybody's going to be like, well, this is how you know ID does it. So ID did it this way. So their video cards are going to be, or, or, or GPU vendors are going to be like, well, we have to make it as fast as possible for ID. So everybody else is just going to program that same way too, and it will actually converge where the optimizations happen. 
I think that that's probably like the best way to go, but so I don't I don't know if that's going to happen. So there are some things that have to change in how the graphics cards works. Maybe that like so right now one of the things is that the texture formats. Um, you know, they swizzle internally the textures rather than. Oh yeah, that has to be made away. public. Yeah, and um, uh, and there's uh, cr- uh, some crazier things with render targets in terms of probably I don't know the details, but you know, in terms of like certainly there's hierarchical Z and stuff like that where they're trying to do that stuff behind your back. The hierarchical Z is exposed now, but um, I I think it just you have to make everything explicit to do that, and so it does mean. And I think you were just assuming this. You were taking this for granted. And so I'm probably just enumerating the things you were assuming. Um, you, you need a, a stronger convergence of the graphics cards to really all work the same way. You know, they, they don't necessarily have to all use the same swizzle format, but they have to document their swizzle format and expose it as a query or whatever. Um, right. But also, like, why not have the same swizzle format? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, who yeah, yeah. Cares? To, us, to us, it doesn't matter. To them, AMD maybe thinks they have a competitive advantage because they have one percent better swizzling. Yeah, you know, who knows? We need to get past that, which is fine. Like, that was sort of my point of my premise is that like we need the hardware people to consider themselves um, um, interchangeable, whatever the word for it, commodities. Um, like they, they just how many cores you have, you know, the equivalent of if. Intel, how many cores you have, really needs to be the only di- significant differentiating factor. And Or you can have extensions or whatever, like you were saying, that you can explicitly make use of. Um, right. But nothing behind your back, basically. I mean, I think yeah, that's, I why, that's I why the graphics why APIs graphics APIs are complicated because they try to hide the stuff behind your back because that way you don't have to implement everything for every hardware vendor. You can just implement to the generic path and the hardware vendor is responsible for mapping to that to their unique features. Um, and we're just saying, or you're just saying that just, yeah, we, we're done that. We, we've we innovated for 15 or 20 years on the graphics cards on that stuff and they've stabilized to a reasonable enough thing that why don't we just lock it all down? Yeah, and I, I don't know why they don't want to. Like, I guess I can understand why AMD might not want to because then... Intel will probably just crush everybody, right? But NVIDIA can sort of compete with Intel now. So I don't know. I think maybe it'd be the death of AMD. I'm not sure. But um, I kind of just don't care, right? Like, I just, I want something good. So just uh, because people who see this on YouTube archived or hear a podcast, if we somehow make it into a podcast, aren't going to see the Twitch chat, let me summarize a little bit of stuff from the Twitch chat. So Fabian says Iris GL and OpenGL were actually radically different. It doesn't, it's not relevant to our discussion, but I just wanted that on record. Okay. Uh, and then he, he also says Swizzle format massively matters. It's intimately tied into their memory architecture. But again, that just means we're arguing that, yeah, then the memory architecture needs to converge. Like, right, exactly. Uh, and like you already said, maybe that means AMD has to die or, or whatever. But like, well, I, I mean, like I understand that the Swizzle format is different, but I meant I meant in terms of like performance differences, right? Like, no, I don't think like you said, one percent was your like thrown up number, right? Like one yeah. percent difference, right? It's like yeah, maybe it is one percent. Like who cares though, right? Like I get that it's gonna, it's obviously gonna have different implications on texture fetch, like all of that hardware, and then all of the memory hardware. But even then, it's like I. As somebody who just wants to write something that works on as many things as possible, the best result for the consumer, like if you're buying a game, you want the best result possible. The way to get the best result possible is to not have to worry about that at all. Yeah. Right. And, and, but like you can do like, even now when you do like a, a shader compile prepass on game launch, right? You can do that with, if, if, if Swizzle format is just so ingrained into the texture fetch hardware and, and all of that stuff. Then you can just have a thing where at the start it says you query the Swizzle format, and then you it, maybe it provides no, it wouldn't have to provide a function. You just query the Swizzle format, and you, you can take your internal textures, bake them out to that Swizzle format the same way that you do for shaders on game load. Yeah. So you, it's just another thing you could do. Yeah, Fabian, but they don't they don't expose that. Fabian says the Swizzle format performance is ten to twenty percent. Of course, oh. I don't know, I don't know if that's comparing between two different Swizzled formats or comparing Swizzled to linear, but uh, also that the Swizzled format 
basically is dependent on like your chip configuration and memory type. Like if you're using GDDR5 versus HBM2, like you'll want the Swizzle format to be different to be optimal. Um, but but right, but, so like, but we're so. But we're arguing, Sorry. but what we're saying is that even if that is a 10%, even if the best Swizzle format is a 10% difference and that you want to expose that to consumers, then your argument is to push that onto programmers, that they have to query that. And if they support the optimal Swizzle format, you get the optimal Swizzle format. And if you don't, you don't get it. Yeah, but even then, it could you could have a function that's like upload linear, download Swizzled, right? Like... You could just do that for all your textures on game load, right? So the first time you load the game, it takes an extra five minutes, which sure. already takes yeah, yeah. long anyway. Yeah, it's an AP- you could add that API thing and keep it off of the critical path of the rendering, the core rendering loop, because because, right. it, like, because it's meant to only be used for this baking step or something. Right, exactly. And like what Fabian just said about um, like G- uh, uh, GDR5 versus something else, if a new Swizzle format comes out on the next generation of hardware, then you still have that same API, which is upload yeah, linear, yeah. download swizzled. Yeah. Um, that's actually what uh, OpenGL had. I don't know if they've stayed supporting it for the compressed texture formats, is they just had a mode that you're supposed to be able to upload your linear texture and it automatically converts it to the compressed format for you. But of course, since it's doing it at runtime as part of the upload, it's not going to be a very good algorithm. And I don't even know if they actually supported it. Um, but that was the premise when they originally did the the extension for that stuff. Um, gotcha. But like I said, they they were putting it in the, not the critical path, but the, the main upload path. And you're arguing, like, obviously, you maybe want to have some facility to, you know, you at runtime, you're baking fonts and, you know, you have a font cache that you need to upload or something like that. So you still probably... Um, want something for that, but maybe that's a case where you can say, hey, you can accept the performance loss some of the time, that there are other things you can do. You can have this low performance baking, and then if you want, you can query the, what the Swizzle format is in a data-defined way and have a generic algorithm that tries to Swizzle to that, which is never going to be as fast as a hard-coded one. But, you know, there's there are things you could do if your goal was to keep the API, keep it from making the API a nightmare. Right. So anyway, and that's that was a deep dive into Swizzle, which is just one of the many things the hardware does. And the argument that we're making with that, uh, maybe Fabian should be having this discussion because well, he's he a lot more knowledgeable than at least I am on this. Yeah, uh, and, and on the actual implementation he, details. He'd be able to be responding to you point by point here and going, "Well, no, the reason why they have to do that is because blah." And I don't know those reasons. Um, yeah, like, but like even if there's a reason, like the proposed solution to that particular reason, I think is just fundamentally wrong sure like yeah yeah that's the problem right like yes there's lots of reasons for everything most of which i don't know but like the the solution that we currently have which is we'll let the driver take care of it is not the correct solution we'll hide all the implement detail implementation details and let the driver handle it is not right that's not going to that's not going to work uh so anyway fabian says they already have the upload linear download swizzled um He's just explaining why you don't have direct swizzled access because it keeps changing. Um, so yeah, so uh, okay, so but, they do have upload linear download swizzle. Okay, that's yeah. Uh, I think it is part of their main path. Like I think it's actually, I think they have that upload as a it's a upload linear and then memory to memory GPU memory to GPU memory blit that converts it to swizzled, so that you can just upload. A linear texture and then at GPU speed still convert it. Um, well, can you like do a GL read pixels or whatever the equivalent but, is? But then he did say download as well. So presuming you can then do some kind of read back to, to bake it. But I don't know. I've never looked at Vulkan and, and uh, you know, I, it's a 20 second latency or whatever for Fabian to respond. So uh, I don't actually know for sure. But presumably they may have done the right thing there. I think they okay, actually maybe do... they Maybe in one this one particular situation they have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but the point is, is that the API complexity is still there. They've they some of these things they may have addressed, but overall the API is still this mess. Is the... oh yeah, it's like the quick reference card. It's like sixteen pages or something. Yeah, well, it's like Vul- no, it, it should Vulcan, be one page. Vulcan, we all know, is just a nightmare. But um... all right, anyway. But I feel I feel like the early OpenGL, it was it was probably like one page, maybe two. Uh, I don't know if it's really that simple. I mean, I'm trying to think back because I have the, I have like the red book, like 1.1, I think. 
which was 96 or 97. Well, I mean, the problem is early OpenGL like, didn't have texture maps or whatever, so everything started getting more complicated once texture maps went in. And I, but I, and that's really just hard to argue about because so much of that is historical artifacts. Like the the, the yeah. badness of that is historical artifacts. So um, I, maybe we've hit on that topic enough. Should we move on? Well, yeah. Like, but do you more or less agree with the fundamental idea of stop doing things in the driver and just expose everything? I don't really have an opinion. Like, okay, like. I mean, I just intentionally just stick with old school OpenGL because I like that programming style. And I noticed I haven't, I didn't look at it closely, but I noticed in when John was coding his animation stuff, it looked like he had written his own little immediate mode wrapper for when he just wanted to do immediate mode graphics. Um, and it's all fine if we have to write our wrappers and it lives on our side, but it's just funny that that's like for a lot of programming you don't want the fast API. You want the simple API. Yeah, um, like 99% of the or 90% of the time, at least you do. And whether that lives in the API or is a wrapper around it, like in my opinion, it actually should be part of the API because, but that's about deployment. That's about like getting it in people's hands automatically and stuff. So I'm always of the opinion that you, this stuff should actually be in the API, but that makes the API more complicated. So that's just like a whole perpendicular orthogonal argument. So, you know, whatever. All right. Um, just checking the stream. Yeah. Fabian was uh, getting a, a, a little um, um, uh, overwrought, perhaps. He, he was asterisking his response as we were yeah, going no, deeper really into that. So, um, all right. So let's move on to a new topic, maybe. Um, yeah, I think, I think Fabian was like... Um harping on like the details of the swizzle thing because I, I haven't looked into the fact that you could do that but yeah, like yeah. i was just talking about the overall thing yeah yeah we, we were trying to just use that as an example but it, there is a valid point maybe he could sit here and every example we could name he'd go well no the reason they have to do it that way is x like uh, and that's why i don't have a super strong opinion about this is because i've stayed on this simple open gl stuff and i've ignored the whole nightmare of the stuff of the new stuff because i know it's a nightmare um so I avoid actually coding in it. And, you know, at RAD, we, the product I do is on, you know, what has been on eight or 10 platforms. And the only graphics layer that I wrote was the OpenGL one. And then Fabian wrote all the others. Um, nice. So I I'd never actually used the console, except the 3DS. I wrote the 3DS one. So I never used any of the other console APIs. So I don't really know anything about them. So I don't have super strong opinions about this stuff. And I don't, I know I'm not aware of a lot of it because I've never programmed it, so I, I, that's why I don't have super strong opinions. I quite like the console APIs relative to uh, the modern OpenGL. Sure. Um, I can't hear you. I wasn't saying anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you know why? Because I'm looking at your the video on your stream oh your yes so, <laughs> not very smart <laughs> yeah no i have three copies of you on my screen right now because of all that stuff um all right well so that was one of the ones that i knew you had a lot to say and i didn't have a lot to say i didn't really have a lot to say it was just like well you had strong opinions you wanted to talk about it i want a simple fucking api yes but okay moving on so so another one that i feel like I feel like I don't have a good answer to this, which is why I low prioritized it and we were not going to do it, but I'm ignoring our discussion about that. Um, oh, shit. Somebody tweeted at me specifically said, I feel like one of your strengths is translation of problems into classical algorithms. Um, and then he had a couple follow-ups, but I never got him to actually say what his question was or like what was the interesting thing about that. So the implication is that it's not a strength for other people, um, which would argue that they're curiousness on this topic is how do I do it or how did I get to be that way or something like that and I don't really know which is why I deprioritized this topic because I wasn't sure to me clear to me that there was much to say but well, I have an exa I have a very specific example about you doing something okay well let me let me just add one thing before you get to that example which is okay uh, I've been doing this um, 
do hangouts with a bunch of people who donated to the AL ACLU as a, as a reward. I was doing hangouts with them. And a, this kind of question has come up on totally different topics. And it's clear I just don't have a lot of introspection into how, as a programmer, I accomplish things in, at that level. But what I did find in talking to people was that it was useful for me to walk through examples of problems I've solved and... They are, they're like, how did you approach that problem? And I'm kind of like, well, this was the problem. This was my solution. And I, how did I get from the problem to the solution? I can't necessarily tell you. But by walking through some examples, like people seem to get value out of that. That is all I was wanted to say. So I was originally saying I didn't really want to talk about this, but we can talk about it and maybe just talk about examples. And hey, it sounds like you have an example. So, Well, I was just thinking about there was one time that uh, Pear was doing his stream on um, his B tree implementation. Yep. And I remember you were in chat, you and Fabian were in chat, and you were talking about. Um, I remember you mentioned something about, I can't even see, this is what I can't even fucking remember. Is I think a B tree is the same as a 343, uh, 343 table. Or is it was that the red black tree that is? I don't remember, right? But you you were very specifically like pointing out the differences between AVL trees, red black trees, and how they were balanced versus B trees, and then how there are, how a couple of different ones are equal to each other. And like I remember reading about that sort of like a while ago. And if I had to think about it, I could look it up or whatever. But like the fact that you remembered the differences between all of the trees and how you would use them differently, like that's knowledge that's just in your head. Where for me, that's knowledge that's like, ah, look it up if I ever need it, but I'm never going to fucking need it. So the fact that you were taking these like really classical algorithms and like you remembered them and remembered like their properties, I was like, oh, Jesus, I can't do that. And I thought that was interesting. Um, so that specific example, um, so that's just partly that is like different people learn differently and remember differently. So I have these, I have uh, uh, this friend, uh, Mark LeBlanc, uh, who was used to be at Looking Glass back in the day. And one of the things in hanging around with him that became very clear is he could often drop, you know, some line from a movie that, you know, is a kind of a classical line, but not one that people go around quoting. And just word for word he just like remembered it word for word and when i wanted to make a reference to that line in that movie i'd be like oh you know when that guy said the thing about and you know i have a couple of the words from the line or whatever um that part of my memory doesn't doesn't work right i don't retain that stuff like that those kinds of things don't stick for me i'm terrible at trivia um like classical trivia but obviously this algorithms and data structures trivia uh, sticks in my brain for some reason. So I think that's a lot of it. So there, it, there's just no, there's no, that's just predetermined or how, wherever that comes from nurture or nature. Um, some of that is because, uh, you know, I had a college education and you took data structure classes and for various reasons, a lot of these things I actually got exposed to in class and like a second class or outside of class for some reason um, encountered it and that just like helps it stick in the memory so the specific thing you were talking about is the fact that the red black tree is also a two three four tree um, and part of why that stuck in my head is because somebody made another tree called the AA tree which I don't remember what it stands for something Ardman or uh, is Ardman the that's the animation people right um the something somebody's initials were AA or something, and that tree is a two three tree. Um, so you know the two three four tree meaning that it's a tree where each node has two three or four children, and then the two three tree meaning it has two or three children. And the idea there, uh, I think Fabian is the one who told me that the red black tree was derived did actually it wasn't like in hindsight it was a two three four tree it was invented by saying hey if we make a two three four tree and then represent it as a binary tree it turns out to be this red black tree and that makes sense right. because the red black properties like when they prove the red black properties how that makes sure the tree is balanced or whatever it makes no sense like there are these proofs and you like they're doing this stuff and you're just like what how does this make any oh, yeah, it sense makes no fucking sense at all <laughs> but apparently the proof through the two if you treat the proof as a mapping to the two three four it's probably intuitive um so um 
So that that's an example of a thing where it might be that the two three four like I heard the red black two three four tree equivalence at some point and didn't quite stick. And then when I encountered this other tree where the guy was like, the red black tree is really complicated. You've got all these different directions of rotations. What if we take a two three tree and make a red black style tree with a, just a two three tree? It turns out you need a few. The code is much smaller because you only need half of the cases basically, and. Um, and that's in there's an, S, a, an AA tree in stb.h that I've never used um, <laughs> and uh, uh, in, in reading about that like that's when it f probably when it finally stuck for me the toll 2 3 and 2 3 4 tree because now I had just enough information that to form a whole little cosmology of this whole class of trees um, but it's possible the 2 3 4 tree had stuck and I just don't even remember like because this was ages ago um uh, and yeah, all I can say is hey, some of those details stick with me without me ever implementing. That was the thing I was going to get to is I've never... Oh, you never implemented it. I, I don't know if I ever implemented a red black tree. I guess I might have implemented a red black tree in college, but I definitely implemented a B tree uh, because I implemented a B star tree and a B plus tree. But um, there's, a, there's a red black tree in numerical recipes, I think, that's just the standard that everyone uses anyway. Yeah, although they like don't include delete or there, there's some... Oh, in numerical recipes. Sorry, I was thinking of Corvo. Recipe? I'm thinking of CLR. That's what I was thinking. Uh, I think it's numerical recipe. Anyway, it's the one that everybody uses. CLR is <laughs> like the standard algorithms textbook. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm, but I think... I don't remember now. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, another thing, though, is you have two checks from Donald Knuth. Uh-huh. That's kind of crazy. Um, like, I have the art of computer programming, and I have gone through and done all the f less than 40 exercises, or the number four, like the difficulty scale 40 exercises, in the first book, and it took over a year. And you managed – have you gone through and done, like, the whole – the whole? have you read all can four you, of the books? Can you finish your thoughts, and then I'll reply? Well, my point is just, like, that's a serious commitment to – um, just reading it all or going through it and doing it is a serious commitment to like understanding fundamental algorithms, right? That I just don't think most programmers do or are willing to do. I mean, I know they aren't, right? Like it would take me another, it would take me five years and I'm, I still might end up doing it to go through the art of computer programming and do it. But like the fact that you found two errors, I assume that you've gone through it all. That's a commitment that most people just don't have. Yeah, I, I just wanted you to get that all on the table before I exposed the truth. Um, right. So I actually found three errors. One of those checks was actually for two errors. Like, if you check it, it's not a power of two. It's the sum of two powers of two. Okay. And, um, but uh, I believe I read all of the, the three, first three books. I haven't looked, I haven't got the fourth. But um, uh, I didn't, I think I didn't do any of the exercises at all. I just read through and retained what I retained and didn't retain what I didn't retain or whatever. But by the time I started that, I know I wasn't at the point where I had to do exercises to force me to understand the material. I could take my time with the material and understand it. And plenty of it I skipped or skimmed. Uh, you know, the proofs, the, the proofs by um, uh, there's this whole mathematical Induction weird step. No, it's not induction. It's this whole like function. I can't remember the terminology for it, where it like converts one class of functions to a different kind of function. I can't even remember what the detail generators or something. I don't remember what it was. Um, and I just would skip all that stuff. Um, the three errors I found uh, were all like very minor errors. Um, the most minor of those, the one I barely got any money for, was there was a missing close quote for an open quote. So I just like. <laughs> I was like, well, still, I, like, I might as well mention it. You're paying uh, enough attention to read. Well, that's that something where you that's that. something where you just like notice it. It's like, why didn't that? I, I'm waiting for that to end. But um, the other two were pretty minor kinds of you know, things, and one of them was in the tape sorting section, which I don't think anybody bothers reading these days. And I was just reading it, you know, because why not? And there was just some little minor mistake. It wasn't like an algorithm had a typo, or I mean, even a typo. It wasn't like an algorithm had a mistake or even a typo, and it wasn't like the proofs had an error in the proof. It was just Did like, it was just, you, you know, like uh, something was misstated or something like that. I don't remember because that was a long time ago. And I was just like, nobody knows what these are for, so I'll go ahead and post the checks so they think I'm brilliant. But I'm not – it doesn't actually reflect the, the brilliance people assume it does. Were there even any uh, – this is just a side question. Were there any errors in any of the proofs or algorithms ever found? 
I have no idea. Yeah. As far I, as I, I know, there weren't. Yeah, I, I doubt it. I mean, presumably there's there's uh, errata, but I, I've never looked at them, so I don't know. Well, there's also, like, the fact that you actually – because this was a discussion about sort of classical algorithms and, and using them as in applications to solving everyday problems, if you are able to read through – like, those books are dry, right? Knuth books yeah, are yeah. hard. They're hard to get through. Yeah. If you have the dedication to get through it and you actually do it, and if you do the exercises or you just you understand it sort of well enough that you don't need to do the exercises, once you get that level of knowledge, I think you can just solve – you could just – you have such a like fundamental understanding of, of these algorithms that you can just sort of apply them to everyday problems, right? I think that that's, that's sort of the difference between – you know, people who aren't able to apply it or people that sort of don't and people that can, right? Well, Do you know what I mean? It may be the difference, but I don't know if that's enough. Um, so, yeah, to get to that question, the translation of problems into classical algorithms. <clears throat> like, it's clear that experience is a huge value. Like, knowing all that stuff well enough to sort of see... But anyway, what I'm trying to get at is that I don't know that that's sufficient. Maybe there is also additional skill. Uh, you know, maybe just exposing yourself to that stuff to that same level isn't enough. Maybe there's something else you have to have done or already have. I don't know. Um, so in terms of, of how do you get to that same level of skill, I don't know that that's sufficient. That's that's just my the, my caveat there, which is why I'm hesitant about talking about these things because I don't want to overpromise anyone. Um, I want to go into a little anecdote. Um, it's a totally unrelated topic, but it's that same pattern of like, how do you do things and how, how did you get there? When I was uh, at Looking Glass, so this would have been, I had been programming in C since probably since I was 19. So probably seven or eight years of C, C++ programming. And I had programmed in basic before that a little. Um, one day, I'm in the office of the project leader. I think this must have been Terra Nova. It might have been Thief, but I think it was Terra Nova. Pretty sure it was Terra Nova. And he's looking at some problem. He was a programmer, and he was looking at some problem. We're, we're looking at the screen, and there's something wrong. There's a bug. I don't remember. I don't remember any of the details of what it was. And we're looking at it, and I'm like trying to think how that could go wrong. And he's looking at it and trying to think how it could go wrong. And we already knew at this point that we had this very different debugging style. And it wasn't an intentional experiment, but um, I wandered off to try to think, just think in my head about it. And he sat down and went into the code and started putting in printfs and try to track down what was going wrong. And I went off and I just thought to myself, well, what kind of, I don't think I looked at the code. I might've looked at the code, but I know I, in general, solve some problems this way. So I was probably just sitting there thinking, well, what kind of behavior of a program could produce that bad result? And from that, I'm inferring what the program is doing, is trying to do and what it's doing wrong and thinking like, okay, then that's the bug. Um, if you if you can like kind of figure out that pattern of what's a thing a computer might be trying to do and might do wrong and c get that bad result. And after, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour, I finally thought of a way this thing could happen. And I walked back into his office and I said, I figured out what I bet it is. I'll bet you it's this. Because that, that's always how I felt about these things. It's like, I could be wrong. I, I have no evidence at all. But I bet you it's something like this. Um, and that's and knowing that is like kind of sufficient that then you can look in the code and find the spot that should be doing that thing and look and see if that bug happens. Um, and I came in and I said that and he's like, yeah, I just figured it out. I just did, did my printf debugging and narrowed it down and here's where it's going wrong. And it was exactly the thing I thought it was. And it took us both exactly the same amount of time to figure it out. But we used two entirely unrelated methods to solve it. So that's just a funny anecdote, right? Of like, hey, two entirely different methods, and et cetera. But the thing I want to say about that is at that point, I was already known, like at Looking Glass, I, I don't know if people really said this, but I thought of myself this way at Looking Glass, as a person who could debug problems that way. It's like, you want some extra eyes on a problem that you're trying to debug, get my eyes on them. I don't even have to look at the code. A lot of the times I can think of something that's worth looking at. Um, and that skill is not like a skill I was born with, I don't think. That was something I came uh, came to over time. And I think of it now in hindsight as sort of a pattern matching kind of thing. It's just like having 
my brain has retained enough has you know it has neural network deep learned enough of these sorts of things that I it I, I can kind of intuitively find this stuff not necessarily rationally find this stuff um and that just I like comes that you applied a fake brain algorithm to a real brain but go well, on well bec- because it has some analogies like it's why I can't introspect it because it's not it's an opaque process to me and the way to get there is to train it a lot to just keep doing stuff to debug a lot of things, to implement a lot of algorithms, to use algorithms when you're doing stuff. Don't always do stuff the simplest way. Do use algorithms some of the time, etc. cetera. Um, I think is what's going on there. And so I think like the, the, if it's true that I'm good at mapping problems to classical algorithms, it is probably largely just due to doing that an awful lot and having sort of trained a neural network to solve those problems. To, to do that mapping for me without me necessarily consciously doing it. I mean, kind of related is like, how do you retrieve memories? Like, we, nobody can tell you. Like, you think about a th- topic or whatever and the t- memory comes to mind and maybe it doesn't and et cetera. And that's a little bit about what's going on when I'm like, how do I solve this problem? It's like, well, I'm trying to recall related topics that seem to match this problem in some way. Um, and then once they come to mind, if I can remember enough about the algorithm and the data structure, I can, you know, do the finish the mapping in my head and decide whether that algorithm solves that problem or not. And I do want to be clear, like I did not retain everything out there. Uh, many, many years ago, I wrote a very convoluted implementation of regular expression search uh, that's on my website. And one of the things I had to do to solve it is you lay out the, the regular expression and you convert it into a finite state machine. And I needed to do a network flow sort of algorithms on that state machine. I had to do, a, there's like a single short, source shortest, fa- is Bellman Ford relaxation, I think was the solution to it. I didn't know any of that. Like I had all this knowledge and stuff, but when it came to solving network problems, I had no knowledge and I had to just Google it or look in CLR or whatever and go, there must be some algorithm that can solve this problem and, you know, hunt around and go, oh, that, oh, the, here's one that solves the thing. Even if you have negative path weights, that's what I need. And boom. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts on that topic. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I don't have that skill at all. Like your debugging skill, mm-hmm. um, I can't even understand code by reading it. I don't understand what it's doing. I just my eyes gloss over, and I'm just like, "Fuck it, I'm not. I'm not even going to bother trying to understand how this works." I cannot understand source code by looking at it because I found many many years ago that if I just step through it in a debugger, I will understand it much much faster. So I don't even. I just <clears throat> my way of understanding code. Like you were just like, oh, I'm gonna like look at you. Don't even need to look at the code or whatever. But like, taking that aside, like you'd look at the code and you're like, okay, I can think about how to solve this bug. I can't even look at code and understand how that how that code works. So I find that to be interesting that you have that very very different um, approach. Well, and that's a great segue into our topic that I wanted to talk about: how you were stepping through code in the debugger to to look at code you had that was other people's code. Um, so I don't remember which stream it was that I watched where you were doing this, but it was some stream where you were trying out some library and you were stepping through the initialization and cursing it endlessly because it was, I, maybe because it was oop or maybe just because I think it was, it was, I think, deeply I think nested. It was my, I think it was my object oriented programming rant actually. Yeah, it might've been. Yeah. Um, and, um, what struck me as the reason I brought it up was because I like that doesn't really cross my mind as a way to approach the problem of integrating somebody else's library into my code. Now, to be fair, I almost never integrate other people's libraries into my code. That's kind of the reason the STB libraries exist is because I am so not invented here that I just have to re-implement everything myself um, and then try to give it away to other people and tell them not to be NIH, um, which is surprisingly working. You would think people would go, well, wait, that doesn't make any sense. But... um, well, I'm, I'm the same way. I have to implement everything myself, too. But, you know, uh, for OBBG, I used Crunch, Rich Geldrich's texture compressor. Um, and I largely did that not so much because I wanted his texture compression or because I wanted um, yeah, the texture being compressed on disk uh, or because I wanted to use a third-party library so much as the fact that I wanted to use... Uh, 
DXT textures. And the canonical way of doing that nowadays is to find some tool. And I don't even know, I, at the time, I'm like, I don't even know what tool people use now because like this, the compressinator from back in the day doesn't seem to be maintained anymore. And, um, and I'm like, and regardless, they're all gonna output in DDS format. So now I'm gonna have to write a DDS parser. And I was like, doesn't somebody just have some solution to this problem that just gets me the, the DXT compressed texture in memory ready for me to download it. And I'm like, oh, Crunch does that. So I'll try using Crunch. And I actually had to, to get it to compile in VC6, I had to do severe work to that library, um, <laughs> which is not his fault. Like it's my problem for using VC6. And that's the other re reason why I'm a not invented here person uh, is, you know, 10 years ago, people were still using VC6. It was a little less crazy, but now uh, I literally can't use anybody's libraries because they're not going to compile in VC6. I guess if I got binaries, maybe I could, but. Um, I see my future. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe I'll switch to Jai and Four Coder and, uh, and be. Uh, jump Actually, from, talking about IDEs might be an interesting thing to talk about. Jumping but, from um, the far past to the far future is always possible. Uh, but, yeah, so anyway, I wanted to talk about that process because. Like one of the things is that like, if I thought I wanted to know what was going on inside crunch, I would want to know what's going on in the part that's running most of the time. In other words, I'd want to like, I'd run it and I would go into the debugger and hit break and find where I am. And I'm like, okay, here's the hot spot probably in the code. Let's take a look at what this code is doing. But the idea of stepping in through the initialization seems crazy to me. That's why I right. wanted to talk about this. Like. Why do you care about how they initialize at startup for some library that you might want to incorporate in your code? Why well, why is okay, stepping that, in from the beginning? Or was that just because you wanted to do the OOP rant? That was mostly because I wanted to do the OOP rant, but the initialization thing is it, it wasn't there, there wasn't like an explicit initialization thing, right? That's one of the problems that I was trying to highlight with OOP. Ah, okay. Is because like the initialization is the constructor of like the thing that runs it and calls the actual execute function that that it, it was a triangle splitter i think um that actually called the split triangle routine or take polygon soup and generate triangles from it or no it took a polygon and then generated internal internal triangles from it um the thing that actually called that function and did the work was the constructor of an object which is why mm. i was doing the step through of the yeah. of of the whole initialization thing. And I was kind of pointing about how ridiculous it is to couple these things together. But um, I, I do generally do that. Yeah. I generally will step, I will run it and step through every single line. Um, and well, I think one, wait, I wait, think, wait. I th how, how sorry. hyperbolic are you being there? Like if it's a 10, uh, 20,000 line library, are you going to step through every line of that library? Like, what? yeah, eventually not at the start, obviously. Right. But like, you know how you start through the initialization thing and where it starts, and you can you can make a very quick and easy judgment: is is this thing concerned at all about how the memory is being allocated? Right. Sure. Yeah. And if yeah. the answer, and and you can see that for the first like ten lines that you step through, right? Because you can you know you search around a little bit and you watch the variables, and you're like, well, how is it handling memory? Right. And if it's just like if it's just like a mess, then you know right away you don't want to use the library, right? So it's a it's a really good like. Um, the Van Halen fucking colored, single colored M&M thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good one of those, right? So you just step through it. Like, how is it initializing, right? Like, is this sane? And then most things aren't. So you're just like, okay, I can't use this then, right? Do we, so do I we think, need to sorry? explain, do we need to explain the brown M&M for the audience? I don't know if, if that has modern currency. I mean, I guess maybe it does because... Back when I was young, the whole brown and M&M &M thing was known, but nobody knew why. And so it was just used as so I actually thing to, do know to make why. fun. No, no. And that's and now in modern times, we've heard why. And it's a cool, awesome thing that connects to what you were saying with. But I don't even know if most people nowadays have even heard of this thing or if we need to explain that whole rider thing. I mean, it's not it, we don't have to explain it but if that was just an analogy or whatever. But I, that's just kind of an... It'll I take was, two seconds. We might as well it, explain it. I, I was just amused at that. So, yeah, you go ahead and explain the whole rider. You don't have to explain so, all about riders, but yeah. So Be when, because, a uh, I, a, when a band comes into a... When a a show, they have a setup crew who run who works at the venue or whatever. It's all unionized and bullshit. And you have a rider, which is like a list of demands. Not demands, but a list of things that the band wants, right? 
water, whores, etc. Right. And one of the things that um, was on Van Halen's list was a bowl of only brown M and M's. I don't remember the color. We'll say brown. I don't even remember if it was M and M's. Could have been Smarties. Whatever it was, they were like, we only want brown M and M's. A bowl of them. Right. And the reason was, for that is because um, it was actually they had very. Wait. Wait a second. It was Sorry. actually better than that. It was a bowl of M and M's with all the brown ones removed. Okay, all the was. brown ones removed. Okay, so um, the reason for that is because they have a very precise, like choreographed. I don't want to say dance routine because they weren't dancing, but they had a very precise stage movement system that they had. And once some the stage wasn't built to their exact specifications, and I think it was David Lee Roth fell off and broke and broke his arm. Because the stage wasn't built correctly, he was expecting there to be something there, a foot place, stepped down, fell, broke his arm. So after that, they put in their rider, they put, we want a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown M&Ms taken out. And the reason for that was it was a very quick way for them to look and see if the people actually read the rider in detail. So they'd look, they'd see all the brown M&Ms are gone, they didn't need to check the stage. If they didn't see it, then they... If they if they, the bowl was fucked, then they had to go and physically measure every single part of the stage so that they wouldn't fall off. So that they could trust that the stage was 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 or trust that all the other things were done correctly. And it became like a, yeah, it became like a thing. It's kind of funny. Yeah. But anyway, so I use the stepping through the initialization to be like it's a really good guide to be like how sane is this library written. And, yeah, um, yeah, it's a it's a canary in a coal mine in a in a yeah. sense of of it's a there's got to be a, some other term for this of like the first a, a, a little in, an indicator that you can use to represent something else or whatever that rep, that is representative of something else. Um, yes. Yeah. Is that know, a maybe maybe we should explain what a canary in a coal mine is because I'm not sure everybody. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. There's uh. gas buildup. <laughs> um, yeah, so I do that. Um, but my general way of understanding any code is run it in debugger and step through line by line. And I think this is a skill. This this relates to a skill that I have that I think is probably better than most people. Or I don't want to say whatever. Um, in the same way that your skill of uh, translating things into classical algorithms better than most people is um, due to experience in what I've worked on. I've written several multi-hundred-thousand-line programs uh, in C that were more or less bug-free entirely by myself, right? And that's given me the skill of I can keep very large, complicated systems in my head pretty well. I think I'm pretty good at it relative to most people. That's probably my best skill as a programmer is keeping large, diverse, complex systems in my head. So when I step through... Um, somebody else's library or somebody else's code, I can keep its running state and expected state in my head, I think, probably better than most people, which um, is because I've always understood code by... Uh, and I'm just sort of realizing this now, is because I've always understood code by stepping through it in a debugger. And I think that's given me that skill, whereas you have the skill of being able to abstractly think about... Um, a, a bug or a problem like that and then sort of reason about how the code might be conformed because that's how you've always done debugging i think it's kind of an interesting contrast yeah i mean to be clear like some of what you're saying is sort of core to programming at, at the level we're talking at the level we all are uh, in terms of having a model of what's going on in your mind and that the program is updating like that can model how the program is updating yeah, sure. Wait, I'm, I'm using the word model there. But, like, that is sort of, like, a fundamental skill. I'm not denying, like, th your specific version of it being this uh, a, 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 bran a branch off of that that's more superior. And Jeff Roberts is another person who spends all of his time in the debugger. His, his way of thinking about how his own program is working is by watching it in the debugger as well. Yeah, me as well. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, yeah, that, I mean, that may just be a programming style thing. I mean, it's not like I don't debug obviously um i use the debugger all the time i love having the debugger tell me things um 
I don't love printf debugging. That's part of that other anecdote was that the way to solve that problem was not to go into the debugger and like watch what was happening. You really had to gather information across multiple frames and other and other stuff that made it resistant to debugger style debugging. It really had to be printf debugging. Some people love printf debugging. I'm not one of them. I will printf debug all the time if that's the best way to solve a problem, but I don't like doing it. Yeah, and that's like I remember Tim Sweeney came out and said that he doesn't even use a debugger, and then Mike Acton sort of agreed with him. If I remember the Twitter exchange correctly, it was like Mike Acton and Tim Sweeney both basically both sort of agreed, and I could be misremembering, so don't. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but like that you can't solve difficult problems in the debugger; it's only meant to solve simple problems. And I was like, "What? Like that doesn't make any sense at all." Right? Like, to me, I can solve really, like, the only way I can solve a problem is in a debugger, right? Like, I had this nasty thread bug uh, a couple of months ago, right? It took me, like, four hours to solve, and, I was, and it only showed up in release, and it was a pain in the ass, so I had to use the release, uh, do release debugging. There was no way I would have solved that without a debugger. There's absolutely no way. And it's like, I don't, I, I just fundamentally disagree with the standpoint of, debuggers only solve easy problems and you shouldn't rely on them. Like, I think that those two things are completely false. And I think that for me at least, and I don't think I'm entirely unique, is the best way to understand code and the best way to understand what it's actually doing is to step through it and run it in debugger. And then you can very easily or very quickly build a mental model of the entire system doing that. Way be- way more accurate and way better than you can any other way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just d- people do have different ways of thinking about things and ways of approaching problems. Um, so shall we move on? Sure. Um, so the tweet was how to program in C in a good way. Mostly talking about games, I think. Yeah. So I kind of I I kind of wanted to rate this low to to not do it just because it's such a I feel like it's a topic that our peers and and we have addressed a, a lot already. So um now, do you? Well, I just use, want to put out, you... I want to put out just a, a one quick thing before we start about this topic. Sure. I program in C plus plus. Yeah, I was going to ask. Oh, okay. I program in C plus plus because I like to be able to add two vectors together, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and sometimes I like a function where I don't have to end it with R and F, or F and I or whatever to take mm-hmm. an inter float. Or actually, that's a bad example. But in general, I, I like function overloading, and I like to be able to add two vectors together, right? If if my choice was use C, use all the C++ features or go to C, it would obviously be go to C. Right. But there's enough C++ features that I'm like, I don't want to restrict myself. Um, yeah, so, um, which I have total respect for. Like, I, many, I am, it's, I think me and Jeff Roberts are the C programmers. Most of the people in our peer group do use C++. John Blow uses C++. Um, uses some. Yeah, but John Blow uses like inheritance and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. He he goes a little further, but he doesn't do deep inheritance. Like no, I I know it just as a function dis- I, as an automated function dispatch. And whatever. I mean, one of the things, one of the bad things in FCB.h is I, there's a hash table in FCB.h that is a 500 line macro, so that you can instantiate the hash table for different data types. And oh yeah. Yeah, you know, and a 500 line macro is not debuggable. Like, there's nothing, there's no way to debug that. I debugged it without it being a macro initially, and then I converted it into macro form. And it's just a poor man's template. It's clear I'd rather be using C++ template to solve that problem if I didn't think C++ was such garbage that I just don't even want to get near it. Um, the right, but I, and, but not. I don't think it's such garbage that you shouldn't get near it. Like that's just for, for me. Um, I think if you were using my compiler, you'd probably think differently just because I don't think like my, my compiler doesn't support it's C not even 99, 
maybe it is C99 because I use 2010, so it's probably C99. But it's not it, like it, I don't think there's a difference anymore, or at least that I know of, between the C and C++ paths in you know, Visual Studio. It's not an issue of the compiler. It's an issue of knowing the knowing that the facilities are there. It's just so I mean, this was a thing I commented about. Like many people commented about like 20 years ago, which is that everyone uses a different dialect of C++ because they subset it and have a different set of features that they use from everyone else. And it's really, that's terrible for like team programming. You can't, you know, yeah, I'm an experienced C++ programmer when you get hired. And it's like, oh, you use a totally different subset than I. Of course, you can adapt and learn. It's not actually a big deal, but it's this weird ecosystem where we pretend it's one language and really everyone is using kind of a different language if they subset it differently. Absolutely. Um, and that's sort of the kind of thing I mean when I'm like C++ is a garbage language that I want to stay away from. It's like, yeah, I could pick the subset of C++ that I'm happy with and stick to that. But in a sense, I'd rather avoid that temptation and just stay away from it. And once in a while, I have to write the 500 line macro, but it's pretty rare. Um, and um, and yeah, part of it is because the C++ in VC6 is not great, but... Um, you know, if I if I just turned on C plus plus and VC six, I'd be able to use declare anywhere. I could write C programs and use declare anywhere. But I give up the void star casting by going to C plus plus. That's really annoying. That's like that's super annoying. The void star oh. thing. You know, and that's and it's in one sense in C plus plus it's fine if you use new for everything, then your malloc's all work. Whereas whereas if you're in C and you use you know, if you try to use malloc itself rather than using new, in C++, you, it's a void star and you have to cast. So if you go with the grain of the language, if you, in C++, you use new, you don't run into the void star for malloc specifically. You might run into it for other things. Um, and I do run into it for other things. The, my, the standard dictionary type that I use for all my programming is a string to void star mapping. And that just lets me stick anything I want in for the void star and I never have to cast. And it's not type safe. But uh, normal in a lot of like small C programs that I'm doing, I have one of these dictionaries, so it's not like there's a lot of doubt about what type is being stored in the dictionary. Um, so uh, where was I going with that? Um, so yeah, so you are setting up the whole C++ question before we address the question of how to program in C in a good way. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Um, Yeah, I don't even exactly know what to say. Like, so one thing that everybody should remember, because this has come up in my ACLU Hangouts, is I have not shipped a commercial game since 2000. Uh, and I've never shipped a commercial game using modern engines. I've never shipped a commercial game that used uh, 3D hardware. I've never shipped a commercial game that... Um, uh, on a console. Um, I do ship this thing at RAD, like a, a, a library, um, but it's not a game. Like the work that I'm doing at RAD is not game-like at all. So my knowledge of game programming comes from writing small indie games, not from writing large indie games or serious projects. Um, like you're, you're talking about 100,000 line things, and I think you know the largest indie game I've shipped is probably 10,000 lines. Right, but I've never worked. I have worked on AAA games, but only on time, like very short, time limited contracts. So, like, I've never worked on a team of like twenty people. On yeah, a game well, before. well, I mean, the the largest team I was on at Looking Glass was five programmers, I think. So, I don't have the modern AAA experience at all. In fact, we right. weren't technically. I'm not sure we were actually considered triple A. Certainly when we were doing the Underworlds and System Shocks, we were not actually considered triple A by our publishers. So um, the uh, that aside, we were obviously considered a major mainstream developer. Um, but but so all that knowledge is is you know his his historical and and etc. So anything I do say about this, you have to at least have that grain of salt that um, it's not based on, yeah, it's just some opinions of some guys. Right. right. Um, but actually, I think that, 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 that actually is, I think that's good advice. Don't work on these huge projects. And the, a, a big reason 
I have for that is like, let's say you were to go work on a team that had a hundred programmers, right? Which I don't, is that, that's, you know, like Bungie probably has a hundred programmers, right? Maybe, I, maybe 50. I, 50? Certainly, certainly there are some of these games, though, like the Frostbite games or whatever, that where I certainly think the hundred programmers across the entire thing, you know, they'll have five UI programmers or something like that. So yeah, I think a hundred right. for the whole thing is probably plausible. Well, you're going to be miserable if you're working with a 99 other programmers, right? Like you're, at least for me, my productivity would be so shot. Like right now I program quite fast. And if I had to work on a team with like a hundred people, I, I my productivity would be 10% of what it is now, maybe even less. And it's just like, that's like not fun. Like well, I don't find that fun at all. And that's good advice. Don't work on those projects <laughs> fortunately the question was not where should i go in the game industry the right. question was how should i write c programs and you're not going to be writing in c if you go anywhere in the industry it's all c plus plus so we already know that the person asking the question actually didn't want to do that well I, I, think I, Insom- I think insomniac is is mostly c oh really well mike Axon keeps talking about c99 and, and all that stuff so yeah i don't know um i don't know how much mike Acton is accurately reflecting the state of the code base of his 30 programmers or however many they have. Um, I think the engine stuff is, 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 is C, or very C-like. It could be. But I don't, know about, I don't know about the gameplay stuff. It wouldn't surprise me if it was C++, but with that they're only using a tiny parts of C++ in the way that everyone does. Um, right, right. So, I mean... The question is a little tricky because, like, is that question asking what parts of C++ do I stay away from? Like, do we only care about the delta between how do I write a program in C and how do I write a program in C++? Or is this from first principles? I mean, you know, make yeah, everything really make everything an array of structs. That's, that's my answer. Like, that's how you program a game. You use arrays of structs everywhere. I... <laughs> Yeah, I sort of agree. I think like, like we were just talking about like, you know, you should learn algorithms and apply them to things. My advice is don't just make yeah. everything an array, make everything an array, and have lots of have to have lots of for loops. That's oh, basically it. <laughs> okay, so you you were asking on chat whether what about the C and C plus plus stuff? Yeah. Yeah, because. Uh... Um... Because Fabian uh, is there. F- Fabian mentioned that it was they were C plus plus, so I, I misunderstood then. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I think, I think if you're going to use C, um, a big thing would be be a not invented here person, right? Like, don't expect to be using a whole lot of libraries. Don't expect to. Um, skimp over details and things like that. Like, if you're going to use C, it's because you want to really understand what's going on and to want and to want to be able to sort of do everything and have do everything that a game engine would require, or do everything that a game would require, and and have the control of everything. Like, if you, I assume that if somebody's asking, they want to have the control. And I think like just understanding what you can, what like the trade offs are, is really important. Like. It's in many ways, <laughs> like I could put together, I don't even know if this is true. I was going to say I could put together a game faster in Python or whatever, but I don't actually think that's true once the game scales past like the most basic, you know, yeah. a, a really minor complexity game. Like I actually still think C is probably the most efficient way to develop games. Well, I the thing is, a part of that thing I was doing about that, uh, my talk, the programming, small C programs, one of the things I showed in that was an example of someone who... Um, was solving some toy problem. It was using looking at a user dict words, a dictionary, a, a, just a flat listing of words, and finding which words were anagrams of each other. And, um, and he was like, you know, I've only just started learning. I think it was Python. I don't know for sure. And I've only just started learning Python. So here's my. I'm a Perl programmer writing Python, so it's not idiomatic Python. It's just like getting stuff done, and it's only you know 15 lines to do it or whatever. And here's the the Perl thing. And like, yeah, and then somebody else comes back and here's the, you know, the idiomatic Python way. And it's a little shorter. And there's like a one-liner, but it's the, un, you never understand it way. 
and one of the things that like it was a little si- side note and I couldn't measure the performance and actually compare the performance but um, I just you know said this is a problem that I would not have wanted to try to solve with before I had stb.h before I had made that my standard lib and I mean it's a problem I could solve easily but it would be you know a bunch of lines of code because getting anything done in raw C is a little painful but um, I was able to write the idiomatic STB thing in a pretty similar number of lines of code as his non-idiomatic Python version. So um, it didn't look that bad. It, it wasn't like, oh, this took me twice as long to write as it took you to bang out the little Python thing. No, it's like I banged this out really easily. Um, and that was, you know, I used the STB has a file loader so I can load a, a flat text file as an array of strings directly instead of having to parse it. Um, because that's something you do often enough that I made it a shared function. And and I use it often enough that I remember its name so I can just type it in as opposed to a lot of the stuff in STBH that I never use so I don't remember the names. STB um, string file. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I used to. Uh, and then, you know, I have some QSort helper functions to make uh, QSorting easier because you always have to write your own comparison function. Um, and so the point there was that that became that library moved that into the space of things that I found intuitive. And now what was I replying to that you said, because I had a point about that in replying to what you were saying, which was, I was, I was talking about once oh, were you, writing a sm- about- you were talking about, you were talking about like, you could write some small game in Python faster, maybe, but once it gets large, it, it stops working. And exactly. my point there is that my point there is that if you have the right libraries for C, I don't even think that's true. I think you can write, the C or C++ and we just don't normally have the libraries for them like the whole universe of Python and or like Perl CPAN and the equivalent things for Python they just have this whole wealth of high level libraries like if you look at the Go standard library it's got all this shit that C doesn't have um, and uh, you know if C had those things that stuff would be just as easy so it's not something really inherent to the language it's really about the libraries that starting the the slow startup and the ramping yeah you have to worry about your memory management and stuff like that but it's so easy to write the first version the dumb version that you have a bunch of static global arrays of things and if you're doing a small scale game you know you declare the array to have a thousand entities you're never going to have more than a thousand entities in your game you're done you never even have to go look at that and malloc it or do anything um so um yeah like flat arrays when you're doing a game flat arrays solve most problems uh, and john blow has talked about this multiple times so that was that was why i was saying i don't know that we have much to add um Obviously, there are some things that are not that. There's all sorts of stuff about writing your game loop and ha- how you structure things. Um, you know, one thing I was talking, to, I talked about this to somebody in Hangouts, so if he's watching, um, this will be redundant. But oh, it wasn't Hangouts, actually. It was I emailed. It was the same thing. It was the ACLD thing. Um, and and, he, and a result of talking to him, I ended up kind of enumerating all the ways I know to do the, the array of objects for a game. Um, so... The naive classical way is that you make a base class and then you inherit it from it for your different object types. And now you have all these different classes. And so then you have to make an array of pointers to them so they can, because they get all different sizes. So you have an array of pointers to your objects and you knew your objects and they're in a class hierarchy. That's sort of like the way you might do this if you got out of college with an OOP education. You might think that that's how you do it. You might use a list abstraction or you put them in a vector or whatever uh, to make that container. There's going to be a factory somewhere. <laughs> Possibly. Um, and then the C way of doing the equivalent thing, um, there are a couple things that you can do. Um, you can still do that pointer indirection, and then you make a union instead of a base class. You just define all the struct types that you need for all your different things. You make a union of all of them. That lets you malloc each one to the size that it actually is, and then uh, refer to it using the union and keep an array of pointers, and you're done. Um, but unless you're size constrained, and we used to be size constrained, and I might have been more likely to do that back in the DOS days. Uh, but once you're not size constrained, you might as well just allocate that union. 
like everything allocate the same size and then you can just have an array of the unions and you don't even need that other stuff but if you so, really if you really don't care about size you can go one step further and you don't use a union you just put everything you need into one struct all the different types every everything just goes into the one struct and now that struct is really big you're going to be cash inefficient and stuff but if you're making a small indie game that none of this may matter every indie game i've released i've never even worried about performance i mean i worried about performance at the way i always do when i'm writing code i never write dumb inefficient things but i never like said i really need to optimize this size thing down for performance kind of reasons um i just rolled with whatever i had and it was fast enough on my machine and it's a free indie game so i'm like oh i'll ship it and hope it's fast enough on everyone else's machines because usually it's not doing very much and so it's got 20 entities in the level not twenty thousand. So what I have done is actually uh, slightly different, and I've done this on the three games, and I'm convinced it's the only way to go. And <clears throat> that's you write a code generator. And what your code generator does is it takes some sort of, you define your entity hierarchy in some way. Basically, there's a base class, class, entity, and then all your subtypes of your entity, right? And what it does is it generates what's essentially a discriminated union form. Mm -hmm. So you have a structure where the first element is uh, an an enumeration for the type. And then you have a union of all the other entities that are inside of it so that the size of each entity is the size of your largest entity. And then you automatically generate uh, in your metadata that you define these structures in, you automatically generate a function dispatch table. So for whatever functions you have. So you can have, um, you know, an update and render Right, so you say, "Oh, I want an update and a render function for this." And rather than it generating, <laughs> rather than it like generating the functions for you, it generates a dispatch update that takes uh, uh, the base pointer to the to the base union thing in it, switches, it writes, generates all the code for you automatically. That switches on the discriminator and calls update underscore that type of entity. And then you make a, and then the generator automatically makes a macro for what that update signature should be. So then you go into a file. You write macro name and then your entity type, and then you just start coding the update function for that, and it's done. So all of your type updates or all of your like dispatches happen automatically in just C, a switch statement on the discriminator. All your uh, entity allocation is the same size, and yes, yeah, your, your largest entity is the size of that entity. Too bad, so you throw some space away, right? And I have found that to be far and away the best way of doing things. All right, so to be clear, that is... Except for the code generation, that is what I meant by putting everything in a union. You do need to discriminate them, um, and I always just do that by making the first field in the structure be the the enum in every structure. Right, um, but it's the it's the automated dispatch thing that's the best. Right. Well, I, I was going to get to that. So, um, and and it has that same property of the size being the same. You could do your thing and add a pointer interaction and actually let them allocate to different sizes if you wanted. Because if you do have a union of the things. Um, But, uh, so that was actually, um, uh, so that actually reminded me of another way of doing this. Um, So the the way the guy was proposing to me that he was doing things was he was keeping a separate vector for every single different type he had. So he had different structures for everything and he had different vector for each one and then he was code generating the dispatch of all so like if when you wanted to do for all things in the level he would code generate all of the for loops for each of them with a different function call for each one which is equivalent to the code generation you're doing it's just looped in a different place but it has obvious problems when you don't have an array of all of your objects so you can't loop over all of your objects or issues and we don't i don't want to go into them um so what I want to say, though, it's the code generation thing is something I've experimented with and decided against. I, like, I generally try to keep code generation out of my code base. And Why is that? Because I find myself using it more and more. And I don't know, right? It's just I had whatever experiences I had, and they're lost in the sands of time now. Um, I think of some of it is sort of deployment mess of, you know, the – integrating it, having to integrate it into your build system, the, that step, extra step. Um, some of it is that the code that you're manipulating is not the code that's running and that uh, can be annoying in the debugger. You can make sure it passes things through. You could force it to pass things through in your code generator, but you don't always want to. Like, there's an equivalent thing. I don't know if this is going to strike 
It's going to be familiar to you. It's something that's not going to be familiar to most people, I think. Um, sometimes I would have these things that were data driven and they're kind of heterogeneous. So I would have this big array of like, it's a structs, but the structs are just defining this data that's going to drive some other process. Like you can imagine it's not an interpreted language, but it's kind of like that. It's something that's saying like, here's what a mission looks like in this game. And it's got these elements, but they're disparate elements in different things. And so there's just this structure that's got this different stuff. And so there's maybe a struct and it's got 12 fields in it to, to define the various capabilities or whatever. And so then I need this big array of all the actual data. And the thing is, is that each line of that thing only needs to fill out some of the fields because it, uh, this only cares about this thing and this only cares about this thing. And so I would make macros that expand it out to all 12 items and like say, okay, here's the macro that represents this data item and here's the macro that represents this data item. And each one would only have the parameters it needed. And if I changed the structure, I would just change the macros to have add extra fields or whatever. Does that make sense, what I'm describing? Oh, yeah, no, no. This is like a very common pattern that you okay. see. What I decided over time was that I didn't like that. And even though it's a little more error prone, I preferred to directly, I ended up expanding out those macros and leaving everything expanded out in the things. I could see what was going on better. It's a little bit the whole C low level programming mentality. It's like I wanted to actually know what was in the memory, not I wanted to see the high level abstracted version of it when I was reading the code. When I was writing it, maybe I felt more comfortable just writing the part I cared about. But once I wanted to see it, um, but actually the thing I end up doing now, most of the time for something like that is even though that data is statically defined, I don't statically define it. I make an empty array or an array with all zeros. And then I use code to fill out the slots of it. And the code can look the same now. The code can look like those macros did. It only has a few parameters. And then in that function that it calls, it fills all the others with zeros. Um, and I can't tell you why that's better. It's just like that I've moved to feeling that's more comfortable for me. Um, if I'll use the filled out data array, but a lot of the times it's too hard to see what's going on in the filled out data array. And the macro data array just doesn't feel right to me. And so I end up doing basically the same macros, but as code and it at initialization time has to fill them out. It's slower, but in a way nobody cares about. Um, and, so what, sorry, uh, so are you done? Yeah, well, that was all my analogy to get back to the code thing. So yeah, your comments on that, the data, that data case. Well, I, I actually, I think that that, that you just, what you just described is the biggest problem in C. It's you want to specify data because data is the most obvious way of specifying the problem. And you want the code to just exist to deal with this data, but you want it all to be static code. You don't want it, you know, you don't want to switch on name at runtime or whatever. Right. <clears throat> and I find that to be the worst thing about C. It's like C's biggest deficit is I specify data and I want code that can operate on this completely um, <clears throat> non-homogeneous chunk of data and just know what to do, right? And that's really, really annoying in C. I've been, I've been I just wrote a parser this morning for uh, assets and assets have a very uh, different, each type of asset has a different bunch of fields and has a different number of sub assets or whatever, right? And then, so I wrote a parser and like, I'm trying to hack X macros in some way that I can easily specify the data only one time and then have the code just work with it and it's just not fucking happening and it's just like this is a problem that if i just had if i just decided i was like going to be uh, going to use a code generator this problem would be solved and i actually think that for this sort of stuff for my my i've tried a lot of things and uh my opinion is code generation is the only way to go Right. Well, so I was trying to use that as an analogy to get back to the code generation. And hey, you've just brought code generation directly into it. So I'll, I'll right, try to address right. it there. I, I mean, I've already established that the code generation doesn't appeal to me for various reasons. And um, other languages have what's called metaprogramming, where your program itself can do that code generation internally, like Jai has it um, as a sort of a... Um, first class thing of you can just generate some code and, and pat, push it back to the compiler. And, but Lisp pretty famously has that kind of facility. That's what the Lisp macros are. They're not macros. That's what like Lisp we is think of designed for, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that metaprogramming is this feature that's very risky. 
uh, to put in your language because it really encourages people to make their own dialects of the language even more so. It makes it harder to understand what the program is doing because they can be using these macros. Like you can look at some list code and think it's doing one thing, but macros are rewriting it behind your back to do something totally different. And I've never worked seriously in a language with metaprogramming, but it aligns those issues people's description of those issues aligns with some of the problems I have with code generation stuff to the point that it does feel plausible to me to that I would have that reaction to using a language with that kind of metaprogramming. So I think of those two, the metaprogramming and the code generation as for different reasons, but mostly for different reasons, probably not being satisfactory solutions for me. Um, so that's another interesting thing though is um part of one of the advantages of working alone is I get to decide um, what features and where to use them, right? So for code generation, for things like what you're talking about is like, oh, I want to be able to see what's going on. I'm talking about for like asset parsing, like loading code, right? Or or something like that, right? Where it's like, I don't care. Like, it doesn't matter, right? Um, I just don't want it to you know, switch on strings because that's annoying too, right? So I think in, in certain situations, for me, fuck it, I think that's a good way to go. But yeah, I, I, I totally get the point of I don't know what it's doing necessarily, so I don't want to do it. In one sense, I think the code generation and the case where I said I prefer the data to just be laid out flat in the array, both point at the same thing, which is I want to look at the source file and have the shortest path to understanding what's happening. Right. And and the code generation adds a hidden step that you need to go look at the source of the code generator, or you, or you have to know the code generator, which, and normally you would know the code generator. It's, you wouldn't have to go look at the source. You'd know what it's doing, its job. Like, I would not probably that be that opposed to the lightest weight possible code generator for doing introspection of structs, right? So, you know, you have the thing where you want to have a way of visiting all of the reflection. It's what most people call it nowadays. Um, yeah, yeah. To have the, I want to know what the names of the fields in the struct are and the types and the address of them. And that way I can serialize or I can pop up a dumb UI that just exposes sliders for every variable, you know, or whatever, those kinds of things. I probably would not be very opposed to using a code generated solution to that other than the deployment, the build system problem. Um, like I've tried and bounced off of it in the past. John uh, talked about that in one of his recent streams. Um, uh, or no, it might've been at Handmade. It might've been the Handmade Con Talk, and I, which I just watched. Um, the old, whenever. Oh, last year's? Two, 2015, whenever it was that he did it. Yeah. Um, it might've been in that, but that he was talking about that for this exact problem, he was saying he took the hard step where you have to go do some extra, uh, extra stuff. Um, and part of that is just because it's like, if you have a hundred structs with 20 fields each, like that's a lot of work. But if you have six structs with five fields each, writing another 30 lines of, of markup to describe them, it's just, for me, I'd rather have the 30 lines of markup describing them than have the extra step that hides what's going on inside my program. But it is definitely at 100, if it's more code than I would ever want to look at anyway, then I might as well have a code generator generate it. I guess it's Also, kind of once, like, once the code generator is done, C is, this is a great thing about C versus C++, is C is a simple enough language where you're not, once it's done and you know it's bug free, it's bug, it, you're not gonna have any bugs with it, right? Like, so I, I don't know. I think that the code generation, I think C actually lends itself quite well to code generation for that exact reason, just the simplicity of the language. Versus something like C++. Where it's, it's, it's definitely like, easy to parse. parse I mean, that's the one of the things when you're doing a lot of these kinds of code generators is you don't actually parse, right? You, you like either add some kind of, you know, markup in the comments or something like that, or you just yeah, but parse. Yeah, C, you could just parse it. Yeah, yeah, but even it's you're often just lazy anyway because writing a parser for C is still a pain. So like, if you can just do a line by line parse, you probably would. Certainly, like so uh, at Rad, the most of us use systems that we generate our documentation. We write most of the documentation, but we also have API documentation that is just directly generated from the header file and comments attached to the thing and you know, we parse the the thing. And I wrote one, and it doesn't do a full parse. It parses 
header file type constructs and it doesn't try to parse the full language. Um, I think if you're I think if you're not parsing the macros, I'm pretty sure you could write a C parser in a few hours. If you're not parsing the expressions and you're not parsing the macros, you're only parsing types. That's not I don't think very hard. Uh, well, right. You have to only parse. Ty- that's the that was exactly what I meant. It's like p- parsing the types. Um, well, and so like so one of the things is I was using somebody else's originally, and one of the types I had was a struct with another with a union inside it or. It might have been a union with a struct inside it, and his parser didn't handle that. He didn't handle nested declarations, right? If the if the union inside it had been a separate union, his thing would have handled it. But having it directly embedded inside it, he didn't handle. Um, gotcha. You know, and so it's just stuff like that, right? It's like you you usually just kind of do that. You hack it until it's working for your case, and then somebody else comes along and actually has some other cases, and you might discover, oh, I didn't make, I didn't bother writing the full re- recursive parser for the exact spec because I didn't bother bringing the spec up and reading it and thinking it at, through at the full level. Um, you know, I, it's really easy to, to half-ass this stuff. You know, it's the... You might have. You could imagine somebody for some reason they're trying to parse the code anyway, even though they don't need to parse the code or they have some problem with the parsing code, and they barf on register because they didn't, you know, that nobody uses that keyword anymore, so they didn't even try to parse register because they didn't think about it. You could easily have those kinds of cases come up, but yeah, see, it's way easier to parse than C plus plus. My point was just that, like, most of the time, if you're just half-assing it anyway, like, you know, as soon as you try to parse templates, you're gonna have you're extra noise. You're, fi- you're, you're done. That's that's so, your. You have a year. Good but, luck. But so it's fine if you're using C plus plus and CFC. You just say, hey, for the stuff where we generate code, you're not allowed to use templates, and you just skip all the stuff with the templates or something like that. It, I don't think it would actually be that much worse to do the code generate for C plus plus if you did that kind of restriction on it. Yeah, probably not. Oh, actually, I, this is just a side question then, because you mentioned um, register. Are near and far still C keywords? I don't think they were ever C keywords. They were only keywords on the DOS okay. compilers. And so MSVC may still have it as a reserved keyword. I don't know. But okay. I certainly VC6, I think, wondering. VC6, I think, does still have them reserved. But I, I would hope they'd be gone in the modern ones. Okay. I, was, I didn't know that it wasn't a C thing. I'm fairly certain. Fairly certain. Um, I, w- I would have been more certain 10 years ago, but I, I haven't even thought about it in so long. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, the so question was writing programs in C, and my main answer was the struct array thing. And then I talked about the the um, the array of objects, and and I drill that was the whole thing. I was drilling down into the arrays of objects, and we were talking about the code gen. Okay, um, so I mean, I don't know what else is there involved in writing programs in C. I mean, so I, I have code, a whole. I think code generation is a big one. I actually think that that's a, that's a good thing to be doing. Yeah, and I think it's a terrible thing to be doing. So there we go. Great. Um, uh, so, I mean, I have a whole separate talk about writing small C programs that um, you could go always go check out. Uh, if you want to see some stuff that's less gamey, that's more about using algorithms and data structures. But um, uh, the main point there was um, to... Uh, some of it is about build stuff. So, but the main point there is just to get some standard data structures that aren't built into C and have them at your fingertips and be able to use them always. Uh, Jeff Roberts has just gone down this path now. Uh, we'll see if he sticks to it, but he came away from this. I'll explain what I mean by this. He came away from this like, oh, this is awesome. Programming C is fun again. Or I, he didn't say that, but you know, it was that kind of attitude. And, um, uh, it's almost exactly the same as what I did and also totally different, which is what I said in that talk and about STBIH is that the two things that I care about are the dynamic array type, which is the STB array, which is equivalent of vector in C++, and the uh, the string dictionary, the map between char star and void star. And just having those two data structures just simplifies everything, and I'm, and I can do so much with that. It's great to have STB string file and the QSort helpers and all the other things that are in there, but those two are like the top, uh, the, the workhorses. And he wrote some new libraries. He was just writing some program and he wrote these things as libraries for them. And it was a string to, he wrote a generic hash table that you can wrap 
in a smarter way than I did it. And I can't remember it was a, if it was string to void star or not. I think it might have been string to void star. But then instead of arrays, uh, he actually did a stretchy buffer that is um, a chunked allocator. You know, it allocates a chunk and then allocates another chunk and ha keeps a linked list of the chunks. And so the array is actually split into these multiple segments, but it never relocates any uh, item in the but array. But he, he couldn't address it with the square brackets though, right? Exactly. You can't address it with the square brackets. And I was like, so you have to use a macro to access and it has to do some linear search or whatever, potentially to find a given thing. And it's like, yeah, for the things I cared about, I was actually basically only ever iterating over everything. So he doesn't even have a macro for find me the 37th element in this thing. <laughs> it's not even really treating them as arrays. It's really just treating them as lists. Um, but couldn't you just do that with on-demand memory, uh, virtual memory committing. Yeah, Just... if you if if you are willing to consume enough of your sixty four bit memory on multiple array, right? Like it's that whole nightmare of you know. Sometimes I do put a dictionary, and every item in the dictionary is an array. And if I have a dictionary with a hundred thousand items, and I have a hundred thousand arrays, and each of them has reserved a big chunk of virtual memory. It could be a problem, right? So um, I think what he could do, if you wanted to do it the way he's doing it, I think what you do is you allocate fixed size chunks and you keep a separate array indexing the fixed size chunks. And so when you want item 5033, you know, you divide that by 1024 or something to find which chunk right. it is. And you can turn it all into an order one thing. It'll still be way slower than an array lookup, but it can be an order one thing. It's a doubly indirected array lookup. I think that would yeah. actually be, and that would have that benefit of what he's talking about is that you can take the address of an item and it is permanent. It will never relocate. Um, and be a reasonable performance, but you wouldn't, you'd still have to use a macro to do it. And that's for me was always the issue was the, the crucial thing was being able to just use array notation. <clears throat> yeah, that's sub that subarray with the you know divide by one thousand twenty four and then and it or whatever. Um, that's how I do uh, like bit fields for anything larger than a sixty four bit bit field like all the time, right? Like if I have single bit flags and I have a thousand elements or whatever, that I do that all the time. I just split it into sixty four bit numbers. Yeah, and that's then a, do that do that macro thing. That's so a classic I, strategy, but. That here we're talking about actually having multiple chunks of memory that are. Separate. Oh no, no, yeah. I know. I'm just saying. But, like, this is a, yeah, that's, a, that's a common common thing. Yeah, lots yeah. Of people do. it's a related pattern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Fabian says there's an STD deck, you know, DQ that is array of fixed size chunks, um, but I don't actually know what API it provides. Um, well, if that's true. Is that act, uh wait, array of fixed chunk size is how ST It's not is it spec to do that or is that just how everybody has done it? Yeah, that's the, they're two separate questions. One is the spec, but what the other is I don't actually know what a deck is. I I've never It's a vector where you can insert at the start or at the end, so push oh, front okay. push back. Yeah. And then it can resize in both directions. Yep. I think. Well, double ended Q, right? So that would be that. Oh, um okay. yeah. But I don't I don't know if it's spec. I, Fabian will know for sure. Is it spec to do that, or is that just how it, every implementation is? We'll have to. We'll we'll follow up once once we get past the he's, switch flag. He, he's just repeating exactly what I. Yeah. What, um, what I just said. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway. Um, so anyway, that was just a side note. Was that Jeff? It's, he didn't actually end up with the same thing because his set of problems is apparently different from my set of problems. Um, I mean, to be fair, I actually like taking the address of the third item sometimes. And to get around that, if I'm using STB array, then I have to make it an array of pointers to things. And I malloc each item separately so that they have stable addresses. And so it's not that I don't ever have that pattern. It's just I, I do the slightly more painful thing to deal with that pattern because that pattern is way more rare for me than the wanting the random access array. And, right. and the advantage of the regular random access array um, that I kind of mentioned in passing about the talking about that um, anagrams in the dictionary problem is that when I write those small programs in C, I'm just trying to write them simply, but I use the order one hash table and the order one 
dynamic array and my solutions for those things are usually if i were comparing them in these speed competitions they're fast they are as fast as the fast ones somebody did a thing where they were doing some optimization thing and they were like so you, you know here after i've done a little optimization to the c sharp thing I, boom i've got this down to this performance now let's get it down a hundred times faster and then he starts doing all the crazy shit and i'm like okay here i just did the first step I didn't try to do the crazy optimizations. I was just like, let me do the basic thing. And I'm already at the speed he got when he did some optimization to the C sharp, right? He had to like, I don't know, fix garbage collection thing or something, you know, he had to do something to work around something dumb in the C sharp thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I didn't have to do the optimization. I, and I didn't do, I didn't do optimization. I just used my standard data structures that I didn't, I mean, I just picked them because they're the standard data structures. I mean, yes, I use a hash table for my map, not a, binary tree for my map but and that's not be, i mean i guess it's because the hash table is faster but it was just i chose to make that be my standard type and i used that all right anyway um what was the point of all that uh we were just talking about how to write simple programs in c so you know that was another thing though is you, you, you just brought up and that um i think is a, a, related to this question is a question i get on stream a lot is why don't you optimize x right like i'll be writing something and i'll be like Eh, fuck it, I'm done, right? Like, I'm done this part, right? And if somebody will inevitably ask me why I didn't optimize it, it's like, well, it's it's already, like, a thousand times faster than almost every other programmer's implementation just by virtue of me doing it in C, yeah. right? Like, it's just, like, it's just so much faster than everything else, and that's a huge thing that you get when you write games in C is that you really don't have to optimize anything pretty much ever. Yeah. Like, maybe, but not really. <clears throat> um, yeah, and, 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 and that may be different for different languages and different problems. I'm sure there are problems where the Perl and the Python solution are competitive with the C solution out of the gate. It, it does depend on the problem. But for a large class of problems... Uh, well, for and, video games. And for, writing, and for writing indie video games, yeah. I mean, cause, like, like I said... The only thing you, almost the only thing you ever have to optimize in... in, in Anything other than the hardest core, anything other than AAA game is draw calls, right? That's basically the only thing I've ever had to optimize is draw calls. Um, collision detection, broad phase collision detection. Oh, well, I don't consider that. I just consider that like if you don't do that, you're just an asshole. Well, but you <laughs> like, know, I'm already doing a broad phase narrow phase collision detection, like, but, and I'm but, already. But yeah, the implementation, of, but even the implementation of the broad phase has to be sane. I mean, I. The naive implementation of broad phases and squared, like I don't, like the moment you start to do a broad fa a real broad phase, you've already had to start deploying a serious data structure or something. Right, but you're going to have to do that in another language anyway. No, oh, yeah, I'm absolutely. talking about yeah. If we're I'm just talking, talking about, about just the language optimizations that are very like yeah, when yeah. you think about when you program in C, you don't have to optimize anything unless it's quite hardcore, except probably draw calls. Because you know you could have hundred thousand draw calls per frame if you're not. You know, careful. Right. Well, and on PCs, you can get away with a lot of draw calls too, but not a hundred thousand, I don't think. <laughs> Probably not. But uh, you, you I mean, get away with tens of thousands. I mean, yeah, these days, something. these days they are, they are now to the point where tens of thousands, I think, is fine. I think N plus plus each frame had six draw calls total. Yeah. Well, and that's the. The hardcore thing that you can get into, this is one of the differences between Iggy 1 and Iggy 2, is that Iggy 2 is better for draw call optimizations. In Iggy 1, we were really stuck by the Flash model that, to just do tons of draw calls. Um, a combination of factors. Like, we couldn't atlas all the textures together, um, which meant every texture change was a different draw call. Oh, well. yeah. Um, I have actually a question. I have a question for you about about something then um not really necessarily related to that but some hardware platforms specifically the psp and the vita maybe not the psp the vita um they don't do they don't allow fine grain state changes i.e you can't just change the blending state you have to sort of batch your state changes um together have you worked on a system like that well it was all like i said the only one I did was 3DS. The on Iggy One, all of that stuff was wrapped away from my site. The way Iggy One worked is, I implemented it in OpenGL, and then I wrote a wrapper around all of the graphics stuff I was doing. Um, 
abstracting it, but not abstract, deeply abstracting it. It was like, hey, I want this scissor rect and I want this, you know, whatever. It's still all uh, direct, pretty direct mapping. Um, yeah. You know, draw, draw some triangles. And uh, um, it included stuff like, you know, uh, hey, I have a texture I want to upload and I'm going to give you the data to upload, but I can give it to you a little bit at a time if you want. Um, in the API so that if on a console that needed to do some processing to it or something could accept the texture data a, a little bit at a time. Um, and, but I mostly just wrote that all based on my knowledge of the OpenGL implementation, what I needed for that. And then Fabian had to come along and make that work on every console. And what that means is that every console Im implementation of the graphics layer for Iggy basically implements OpenGL style semantics for resource uploading during the middle of rendering. Like you're in the middle of rendering a frame, you've already used this texture somewhere in this frame, and then we come in and we say, well, we have this fixed amount of memory allocated for our texture usage, and Iggy says it has another texture it needs to upload. Um, you've got to make space for it, and it has to free out that texture, even though that texture's already been used, so it has to fence and wait till that texture's done, and then it has to free that memory, and then it has to defragment potentially to make room, and now it st starts accepting the texture upload, and all that works, and he had to implement that on every console, except the most recent ones we didn't bother supporting that. If you don't have enough memory, you're fucked. Um, that sounds like fun. Yeah, and so I didn't deal with any of that shit. That was okay. what, what was what your question was. But we did. Yeah, my question we, was specifically about how you abstract certain parts. But uh, but that was the thing was that we like did the, totally the wrong thing. I mean, there were, so there were reasons for that, which was you know, we were respecting the what the flash file requested, and we knew we had the flash file front, so you could in theory bake an atlas of all the textures in the flash file, all the bitmaps in the flash file, but the way flash things could potentially use it is like, well, I have four compressed background images that are big, but they're compressed in the file. So they're not that big in the file. And I only use one on each screen that I switch to. Um, so having them all take up texture memory and they have to be RGBA 8-bit textures. You can't use DXC compression on them. So they're pretty big when you decompress them and store them as textures. So we're like, uh, that trade-off doesn't feel right to force you to have all of them always loaded. So the, we were like, uh, at the trade -off, we, this is all me, trade-off was like, ah, uh, let's go ahead and leave them compressed and download them on the fly and have a cache. Um, hey, that just works in OpenGL semantics. That was the entirety of the process I was thinking about when I designed that system. And it has this advantage that you can throw any flash content in it. And even though you don't have enough memory to display that flash content, to have all that flash content unpacked at once, it can even do this thing of uploading the resources during the frame and manage to sh show you the thing. It'll drop to a frame a second or three frames a second or something because it's thrashing this memory uploading during like, having to re-upload textures every frame but it would display correctly. And we're like, ah, correctness. Hey, it sounds like a good trade-off. It's totally the wrong trade-off, but it was the trade-off I made. Um, you so, couldn't do like a double buffering thing where rather than having three or four or five or whatever, you just had two of them that were always available and then you could swap one out, keep one in the cache and then, you know what I mean? Well, it's just, you pick any fixed amount of memory. Like the, you're you're given a certain amount of GPU memory to work with. Like that was the premise is that the right, right. game says, he, here, you get... 50 megabytes for your texture memory. If the flash file has 250 megabytes of textures in it, there's nothing you're going to do. There's no way you're going to make that work. Except we make it work, we're just slow. We make it right, work right. by uh, just uh, thrashing that, that texture memory. Um, it would be perfectly fine to just say, yes, you're not allowed to have that much texture memory being, you know, you have to increase the texture memory allocation if you want to run that file. Would have been fine. It was just not the choice we made in Nikki one And... Um, I mean, and there are reasons for that. It's because it's all hidden by flash. So like it's the, in, when they're in the tool making the thing, they have no way of knowing how much memory that thing is going to use or anything like that. Oh, yeah. Whereas in AG2, where we have our own tool, we can be telling them up front, hey, this is how big all this stuff is going to be. And, and it's predictable in a different way. Um, anyway, so that was all a very rare way, roundabout way of discussing whatever topic it was we were discussing. Um, Something about writing C... <laughs> writing in C. Yeah, well, there was a specific subtopic that we you had asked about the AP, graphics APIs or whatever. Oh yeah, I'd asked about the the differences between like 
Never mind. Oh, the yes, Vita and the... The, 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 the Vita works one way, completely different than everything else with regards yeah, yeah. to changes. Um, and like how you guys wrapped it, because that's, that's always a problem when something works. When one thing works one way and 25 other platforms work, to, work the same. Yeah, I, I don't remember what the Vita PSP difference is. And NDA, for NDA reasons, we may, may not be able to really talk about it. But um, the, Might not have been the Vita. Uh, the, the thing, that, the big change that we made was... <laughs> um, in the recent consoles, or at least on the PS4, was um, people would like to do multi-threaded rendering. And basically that means we need to be able to build a command buffer that will draw the UI scene. It is a UI thing. Um, so we need to be able to build a command buffer and say, okay, we're done. We built the command buffer. Go run this command buffer and that'll draw the thing for you. But the whole process I just described where we have to be able to fence and wait for the thing to finish rendering so we can upload the next texture doesn't work under that that, that constraint that you're producing a command buffer that you just run um, because you can't fence. Like, you can sort of fence. Well, so I'm, the point that I'm getting to is that you need to store all of the texture data that you need to upload in that command buffer to make that work. Like, you can still store in a command buffer, upload this texture and then upload this texture oh and then it turns out we'll have thrashed the texture memory so now upload this texture the first texture again like that could happen in theory and it's really dumb because that means that command buffer is storing like multiple copies of this texture and your texture memory that you're trying to use as your cache is smaller than your command buffer so like it doesn't actually make any sense to go down that route but that is the way our new stuff works we like don't ever fence and we don't uh block and so you can get in that state. If you allocate to us a large enough command buffer and a small enough texture memory, we will actually generate, as far <laughs> as I know, generate that sequence where we upload the textures multiple times. Maybe we don't. I don't, I don't know the details of how that stuff works. He may have just made that stuff not work at all if that happens. Um, well, th thankfully, memory required, like maximum memory usage isn't really a concern so much anymore. Right. Well, that was why the switchover happened was because the PS4 and the Xbox one both have much more memory and suddenly that uh so and, and because the ps4 basically we kind of had to go the command buffer route we had to go the non had had to go that way so um because of the way their api works and so that forced us down that path but you know that's closer to the right thing anyway on the way stuff should work now so that was that was just an amusing thing and so that was where our big switchover happened in terms of dealing with the apis doing different things um, I mean, the other obvious difference is just that the mobile, the thing you mentioned early on, the whole tiled uh, memory, um, which is not so visible at the API level because they're just batching everything for you, um, yeah. but uh, has radically different performance characteristics for certain workloads, like our workload. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're at two hours. Well, we started a little late, but basically at two hours yeah so do you want to keep going or well do you want to um do you want to take some questions from people because we said we we're going to do two hours so we can take some i don't mind keeping going though but okay, like well first of all i don't think we said we were going to do two hours i don't remember a time ever being said oh okay i'm fine i don't care so uh um... i'm just thinking do we want to do you want to take a, a break to answer some people's questions because i know there's been a lot of chatter that we haven't really responded to yeah, sure. Um, go ahead and um, chat. No, I'm gonna leave. To... I'm gonna leave that to you while I go pee. I'll be right, All right back. Chat. Go ahead and address questions to me. Um, like put an at nothing's to at the front, so that I make sure that I see them. Or apparently, Insobot didn't put an ad at the front, and it still worked. And nobody has any questions.
Uh, oh, headphones. There you are. No, nobody has asked any questions since you left. Well, none that I wanted to respond to. Okay, I just thought of something that was uh, 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 that was funny. So you specifically, when I was talking about never having to optimize anything, and you specifically mentioned the um, broad face collision thing. So in my game that I'm working on right now, I did do an optimization, a quote optimization on broad phase. I did it mostly as like I could spend a couple of hours and teach people something. So I changed um, my linear. It's, I just do a 256 by 256 grid, uh, uniform size cells. And um, I did a linear addressing for them. And I was like, oh, I'll teach you guys how, you know, I'll teach you uh, a Z order curve or Morton curve. So I changed it to Z order curve um, addressing. And for some fucking reason, it was slower. And I was just like, ah, fuck, that's why you don't optimize. <laughs> um, there, there was one question that I skipped, uh, that I accidentally skipped, actually. I'll go back to it. I wanted to say um, about broad phase collision detection, it's because I mostly make these indie games with 20 entities, I don't do any broad phase collision detection. Uh, right. I've done I've done it in school or I, I did I, the first thing I did at school I've talked about this before is I wrote, implemented plane sweep uh, uh, rectangle collision for uh, the first company I worked at but um, it wasn't actually for games and uh, and at Looking Glass I wasn't the person writing the collision detection stuff so I never wrote the broad phase stuff for them I think I've done it maybe just like experimented played with it on some projects or something but um, when uh, a game I have right now. Um, uh, an indie game that I've been working on off and on for a long time, for a couple of years, um, little 2D game, um, for various reasons that I will not delve into, um, I want to be able to simulate about 40,000 frames per second. And, you know, that means that all the physics and stuff needs to be fast. And, uh, you know, it's a, 2D platformer with like moving platforms so things need to collision detect with the world and with the moving platforms and because there's only 10 or 20 entities in the scene I don't bother doing broad phase I it was like I didn't it was just oh, I'll just do the dumb implementation first and when once I've like really need to have the speed I'll come back and implement some kind of broad phase thing you know, just because, hey, collision detecting and one each entity against one other entity is going to be faster than collision detecting against 20 other entities. But computers are so fast, like, you know, it was fine on my dev machine running single-threaded. And, you know, by the time the game is done in two or three years, or whenever, if ever, um, you know, every maybe everyone's going to have machines as fast as it was when I wrote it, and I just never need to optimize it. And it can run forty, simulate forty thousand frames per second, and because the levels are small, it's just not a big deal. So yeah, part of it is, is C is fast and computers are fast. So for a lot of for the problems that a lot a lot of the problems that exist are at a scale that's small enough that the naive C program is pretty fast. Yeah. And like that's the thing about using C versus another language is that the naive anything else isn't fa isn't fast enough, which is actually remarkable if you consider how fast computers are. Yeah, like it's it's crazy that you can't make like a Java program or a Python program run at reasonable speed. It's just insane to me that that's even possible. Don't Yet Java programs are. don't Java programs run at reasonable speed nowadays? Most I don't think like heavy UI type stuff. Well, right, like I but I think that's a failure of the UI li li libraries, probably not a failure of Java. Per se, yeah, I, I, like the server type stuff, like data processing type stuff. Yeah. I'm sure it runs fine. Um, or like probably if you're using processing, you know the that weird Java wrapper thing that's for doing graphics programming that was I have popular, used processing, processing it's kind of nice actually. Ten years ago, that's probably fine. Like because again, you're probably not. I mean, when you try to write the 500 million particle sim in it, maybe you are losing some performance to Java that, that's noticeable, but probably most of the time you're not. Uh, all right, well, let's go to the questions from the chat. So here was one that I don't know if I really have any answer for. What is a clue for when abstraction becomes an implementation detail? I don't even that's know That's the thing the is I don't even understand that okay, question. Okay, good. Then we, we'll move on and he can clarify it if he wants. Okay. All right. Have you ever thought of writing a software renderer with OpenCL? Well, so a bunch of people have tried doing software renderers in compute of various kinds, and I haven't paid any attention to that work. It hasn't ever hit the mainstream, so I assume they're not performant 
to to a, a sufficient level to be interesting. Um, Not like a I don't think a polygonal one would make sense. I think maybe something that's like non like polygonal rasterizing might right. Make well, sense, there's but... the there's the I guess media molecule that has the dreams for the PS4 that's not out yet, but where they're doing yeah. not non polygonal rendering, and I think it is mostly compute. Um, yeah, they make I think it makes sense for that and is interesting, but but you have like to the it's idea a... of just re implementing OpenGL or something in compute is kind of stupid. I think. Well, there was I remember that ten or fifteen years ago, people were experimenting even before we had full programmability. Um, like when we just had the earliest shader programs that were like really limited, people were experimenting with trying to implement render man in on the GPU by, you know, t turning the render man shaders into these multi-step things that had to compute tempor temporaries into the render targets and then reload them from the render targets on the next pass and do all this crazy stuff. Um, right. And I know some people have looked at the idea that uh, rasterization on... Uh, our current graphics hardware is really targeted at this assumption that like triangles are 10 pixels on average or whatever. Like there's a, there's this whole assumption that you can do the shader, the, the quad shading of pixels or fragments um, that breaks down performance wise when triangles get really small. And um, so no, people were, so people were experimenting with things where I think paper, there were papers with the results that are like, we actually are faster with our compute shader doing, rasterization for really small triangles than the native hardware is. When um, you say really small, do you mean like sub-pixel triangles? Like, yeah, like yeah, exactly. Style? Oh, okay. yeah, exactly. So when you want to start, because we do want our image quality to get higher, we should be going to Pixar style eventually, right? We should be doing something that produces that image quality. I mean, Pixar is moving away from that stuff and doing global illumination and stuff now, so who knows? But, um, but that whole idea of having the sub-pixel, well, I mean, Render Man actually tries to optimize their triangles to be one pixel ish size in in reality, but um, I thought they were. I thought when I read on Toy Story three, I think it was like the average triangle size was a tenth of a pixel or something like that. Yeah, okay, maybe my understanding was wrong, but you know, because the whole idea is that they have these parametric <laughs> surfaces that they can tessellate to whatever density they want, and my understanding was that they tried to adaptively tessellate them to about one triangle per pixel but it might be that it might be that what you're saying is true that because they are they do have finer than pixel um shading uh uh higher resolution right they're doing like eight by eight super sampling or whatever something like yeah. that so it would make sense to allow the the polygons to go a little smaller than a thing and maybe it down to a tenth yeah i, I don't know um well did you see their most recent like publicly released everyone's going up and everyone's going insane about it where they had like the great individually models grains of sand like, grains the, of the, sand the that were 5,000 triangles each yeah yeah um, so yeah there they've clearly gone smaller anyway so I do believe there was a paper that was doing that kind of thing where it kind of maybe makes sense but it was still a research oriented paper it wasn't like a production kind of thing and you know the, the graphics APIs probably really don't lend themselves to hooking that stuff up to the shaders the op optimally at the current the way current hardware is so who knows but anyway so yeah so the short answer is that i haven't really paid any attention to what the people are doing and the long answer is all the stuff we just said um if you aren't using introspection how do you normally handle serialization so you just write a function that or or write some data in a in a array of structs that describes the introspection data by hand you just say you know, like I, I would tend to do this as a set of functions where, um, so for each struct, there's a, a function that defines the introspection data. And it just says, there's a little macro and it says, here's the name. And I had to write it out by hand. Here's the name, you know, uh, and maybe I, um, maybe I make the macro do some of this work for me. So uh, I type in the name of the struct and the name of the field and the name of the type of the field. And the macro goes and expands and does an offset of macros so it can find where the offset of in the, the thing is and does a string convert thing to turn the name into a string so that I have the name at runtime. Um, and I just have to manually up that, update that when I change the structure. And if I forget to manually update it, I, you know, I'm fucked. Um, but then, and then I can 
append extra data like, oh, what should the initial state of this variable be if I'm loading an old file, you know, or something like that, which you can all do in other ways. Like, I'm not saying this is a superior thing, but, you know, like, it all does fall naturally into that. And I believe that was the thing that John was talking about in, I believe, the Handmade Con, or maybe it was in the Jai thing that I don't remember now, um, where he, I just remember he was saying that, A, you can do this code generation, or B, you can have to do a little extra work, and you just do the little extra work. All right. I, I assume you had nothing to say about that because you use code generation. Yeah, but for serialization, almost all, all like ninety nine out of ten, M map, M copy, done. Yeah, I, and I should clarify. Yeah, for the the thing I just described is how I do how I simulate introspection. But almost all of my serialization, I either go through the struct field by field and think about what I want to do with it explicitly and handle it, or I do what. Sean just said, and just write it to disk. I've leaned, write, write the struct as is to disk. I've generally leaned in the other direction because I was trained on writing portable code in an environment where the base data types and uh, and the endianness were not guaranteed across uh, different platforms. Um, I've, you know, I learned to program C on Unix machines and C at the time back in those days, which is, you know, the nineties, people were like, C is the only language that is portable. And what that meant was that you had to have a whole bunch of if defs in to handle all these different cases. And, um, you had to recompile it on every platform. And that's what portable meant because you could actually do that. Whereas in Fortran or something like that, there was no way to express any of this stuff. You couldn't write one program that worked in all the places. In C, you could write one program that worked on all the places if you did all of the crazy magic voodoo to explicitly handle all of the cases. Obviously in something like Java, that's way better. And just in general, that's better now. And in general, it's even better because everyone has settled on Lindell Endian, so you don't even have to worry about Endianist conversion. But for serialization explicitly, because that went out to a disk format, I had a real habit that I learned early on of explicitly defining what the byte layout on disk was that was totally separate from the representation in memory. Yeah, if I cared about that, and I used to, because I mean, I should have yeah. game on PS3, right, which is big Indian, so I, yeah. that used to matter. And I worked on a, I had a Mac and, and, and stuff too, right? So it did matter before, back when it was PowerPC. And all you would do is the first four bytes, you would put, you know, zero, one, two, three, read them first, and then if they were zero, one, two, three, then you knew that they were a, a little Indian because that's what you originally wrote it on. And if not, you fucking you just flipped everything. And right, it but really to, wasn't. But to sorry. flip everything, you need all the introspection data. You, you need to well, know you the just types need to know of everything. The, the sizes. Of the everything, sizes. Right? If, every, yeah. if everything is just an integer, a yeah, thirty-two yeah. bit integer, or a sixty-four bit integer, or a sixteen bit integer, then you could just do the offset yeah. of. I guess you would have to, but eh. like, like you said, you don't you you don't need you need the size. Like you don't care if it's a thirty-two bit integer or a thirty-two bit float. You Indian swap it either way. Um, right. You, you do the same Indian swap for those. So you do, you do just need to know the size of each thing, which you can do yes. with the macro by doing a size of the field. I think there's a, is there a size of for? Size of the, size of the field. I don't. Size you, of the null pointer. Yeah, you have uh, to do the half. Just a null pointer to the field right. minus, or not minus anything. That would yeah. just be it. The, the offset macro of macro exists and just solves that problem for the offset calculation. And the naive way when there wasn't an offset of macro is to do exactly what you just said, but do that to compute the offset of the the thing. And it's that's funny that they put in the offset of macro so you wouldn't have to do that hacky thing. That is like in the spec, not guaranteed to work. One, of, it's one of those dumb spec things. Um, but I, they didn't. I don't think they did a size, you know, a, a, the equivalent struct size of or whatever, like offset of. Oh, I don't know. It, it's the I obvious. Just, I never do that. The, anyways, I, I just no, it, it's yeah. I, it's just the obvious symmetric thing to do. If you're going to have an offset of struct comma field, why not have a quote unquote size of struct comma field? But oh well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I anyway, why. so. Cause, yeah, because so, yeah. then you'd have to pragma pack and then one above to figure out the size. That's, yeah. Um, <clears throat> have you ever found a way of programming, in quotes, a way of programming, stupid in the beginning, but later realized that it is very useful? I mean, probably, probably. So, right, like, I've always been a pretty good programmer. Not always. When I was 13, I wasn't a pretty good programmer. But, um, 
you know, I started programming at 13 and I spent way too much of my life programming, writing basic and assembly up until I was 18 and went to college. And so the, by the time I got to college, I was already a pretty good programmer by some standard. Um, and so I've probably had a lot of hubris or, uh, over the years of thinking I'm a really good programmer. And so I would not be surprised if there was something that I was like, that's a really dumb idea. Why would you ever do that? And then backed off from that opinion. Um, but I can't think of anything specific. Um, the one case I can think of is not my story, is John Blow's story from when he gave a talk about how to write independent games, which amounted to do everything the simplest way, use arrays of structs, you know, that same kind of argument. And the story he had in that, which I cannot give word for word accurate. So, you know, this may not have been exactly what the story was, but he was looking at Doom, how Doom loaded file, loaded some, some data file and was on a mailing list or something and commented that he thought it was really dumb or maybe he didn't comment in public. I don't remember, but comment that he thought it was really dumb that they were doing this inefficient way of loading this thing and they could do this much smarter thing that would be, you know, super it's the way you're taught to program in college, the apply the smart algorithms, do everything right. And that later he realized that that was dumb um, of him to think that because none of this mattered because it was the loading time stuff, which was already plenty fast. And just doing it the simplest way is way more important because it reduces your bugs, lets you move on to the next task sooner. You get more done on your project overall. And I'm... <coughs> I'm sure I've done the exact same thing about stuff, <coughs> excuse me, of looking at some system and thinking this could be done much more optimally. I'm sure back when I was younger, I made that exact mistake that he described. I cannot think of any specific cases, but that's kind of the opposite of the problem you actually were, I think you were trying to pose, which is like some sophisticated way of approaching a problem that seems dumb at first and turns out to be smart. Like, I've only seen the opposite, which is, like, thinking that you should do the sophisticated thing and realizing that the dumb thing was the right way to go. I think I, I completely 100% agree with that. Like, because you hear about this is the new programming paradigm, this is the new way to program, this is what all the cool kids are doing, this is going to save so much time. Every single one of those things has been completely, whatever they said was the case, I have found it to be the complete opposite and the only thing that's ever worked for me for programming is to do the dumbest thing possible, and that's if A, do B, else do C, etc., 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 right? Just everything, I think everything other than the simplest thing possible has always been wrong for me. Um, I do want to kind of contradict that. It's not a real contradiction. You're not going to disagree with anything I'm saying here, but our peer group does have this habit of making that kind of pronouncement and... I want to say that historically, there has been this path of people saying, here's a better way of doing things, and that we have that criticism of. But if you look at the historic history over a long enough period, going back far enough, they were right in the early days. Going from assembler to a high level language was the correct choice. And um, the most important thing to me, the reason I thought of this whole thing is that, uh, and another example, let me use one more example first um, before I get to my, my valuable one, is the whole structured programming instead of using go-to statements. It's huge. Like using if, then, and while loops instead of writing everything in go-tos is definitely advantageous, definitely superior. Um, and the one that for me is the one which is where I stopped, I think. It's the last one, uh, was abstract data types, which is uh, a thing that's akin to object-oriented programming, but object-oriented programming just takes it way too far. Uh, and an abstract data type is just the idea that you have some data and some operations that operate on that data and abstract it away, and from the outside, you don't know the details of what's going on inside of that. And so when I was talking about having the dictionary mapping strings to... Uh, void stars like that's an abstract data type i i don't when i'm I, yes i implement it myself and i know it's a hash table but when i'm interacting with it it is a dictionary i put things in it and i get them out of it and i don't care that it's a hash table um and i learned that in college like there was a a class where they taught us abstract data types in, in the 90s that I went to or whatever. And it wasn't like nobody ever knew about this. It was a decades old idea or something, but it had to be explicitly taught. Um, and 
uh, that has gotten subsumed into object oriented programming. I feel like nowadays people are familiar with that idea, but only through objects. Um, you do see the terminology occasionally, but anyway, none of this actually relates to your question of, uh, seeing a thing and thinking it's, um, dumb and then later t deciding that it's a good idea. But I wanted just to, and again, I, I, I assume Sean doesn't actually disagree with me about anything I just said, but I just wanted to say that historically there have been developments that were improvements that you definitely wanted to get on. Yeah, basically just read everything by Dijkstra and then yeah. stop there. Um, so uh, That's pretty good. That's pretty good advice. <laughs> so I'm going to, first I'm going to scroll down and see what the replies to our most recent stuff are, and then I'll go back to the, the things um, that were still pending. But I actually, I want to sort of ask you about this. Do you think that's it? Like, is that it? Like, is this as good as programming is going to get? Because the last 20 or 25 years, last 30 years have been mostly, mostly regressions. Yeah. Um, let me answer a, a, a con there's a comment here that I just happened to scroll by in chat that wasn't even a question or it wasn't even directed at me but I happened to see it so I wanted to comment on it and which kind of will connect to what you just said so uh, Ginger Bill's comments I wonder if built in Indian specific types would be a good thing e.g. U32 U32 LE U32 BE big Indian and little Indian um, and yeah I think a systems programming language which is what C aspires to be um, ought to have built in facilities for not necessarily types, but it ought to have some kind of built-in facility for dealing with Indianness and dealing with uh, alignment and things like that. And currently in C, like there are some things you can do for alignment, but one of the things you need to do when you're sort of manually, manually implementing a uh, memory manager, you, you like, I want to replace the malloc for this. I want to do something smarter for my memory. So I'll write a little memory manager for uh, my allocations for this. So I'm going to have a pool of memory and pull things out of that pool. You need to align your pointer accesses in that. And to do an alignment operation on a pointer, you have to convert it to an integer, do the alignment on the, do the alignment math on the integer, and then pull it back into a pointer. And modern C uh, now has the uint pointer type that is guaranteed to hold the pointer size. Um, so you can do it on the UN pointer, but you need some way to do that conversion operation. And nobody is even sure what in the C specification allows you to convert a pointer to an int and back, even though it's supposed to be a systems language, right? We, um, we used to do this cast. We would just cast between them. And then the strict aliasing people came along and we're like, okay, casts aren't safe. Je normally between pointer types, but the, I believe it applies to the integer conversion as well. So we all switched to using a union. You have to store the pointer in the union. Then you fetch the integer out of the union. You do your math. You store it back in the union. You fetch the pointer back out. Okay, now that's fine. And then somebody on John Reger's blog, um, at, or maybe it was John himself, commented that actually it seems like the spec isn't clear that that's actually safe. And so some future optimizing compiler might actually make that thing safe fail. And there was some even more convoluted way of doing it that is safe. And I don't remember the details of this. Um, a systems programming language should just have some thing, like just freaking define a function, a, a pseudo function that converts a pointer to an int and back. And then the compiler knows for sure and is done. In the case of the little Indian, big Indian thing, the thing to do would be have an extra type tag or whatever you call those modifiers. Rather than base, build it into the type, just be able to take any integer type and declare it little Indian or big Indian. And it's the compiler's job to do the conversion. And you don't expect it to be fast. You expect it's not systems programming. Like it's weird to say that that's systems programming because we think of systems programming as meaning it should be C and bare to the hardware and do that stuff. But there are things that system programs need to deal with, and things like endiness are one of those things. And there should be facilities in the language to do it. That's my opinion. Well, I just want to. I'll just want to add two additions to that. One regarding the endianness. Stop making big endian CPUs. Stop at IBM. No yeah. one cares about power. Stop. Yeah, Little my life would be easier. Just give up, okay? Would... And then the other thing is um, just have an align qualifier. Mm -hmm. Align to whatever, right? Just have that. Don't make me pragma fucking path the struct and then calculate the alignment manual. Just fuck off. Just give me an align. Like, you want a big Endian qualifier? I want an align qualifier. Yeah, and there's some chance that John's John Blow's language is going to have 
some of these features because he wants them. He's making a language for game programming specifically. Um, and I don't actually even care that much about game programming as systems programming. Like I actually care more about systems programming than game programming to some extent. But, um, but I think those are... So it may turn out that that's a better language for systems programming as well as game pro games programming because games programmers care about performance. So that kind of stuff might show up there. Um, but anyway, so then the actual question uh, that you had raised, right, was... Um, I don't even remember what it was. I, I, said this, I said that this was related. So you had said, uh, oh, is this as good as it's going to get? Is oh, this what well, programming is? I mean, like, yeah, I mean, clearly it's not, but like... No, 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 that was the point. Like, it? that was the point is you don't mean at that level. Like, oh, there's all these little tweaky things we can do to fix it. I, 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 it was intentional. I was always like, yeah, there's these little tweaky things we can do to fix it. But you look at Jai, you look at John Blow's programming language, and you're like, that's not very different. Like, you, and there's like a lot of the complaints on Reddit or Hack at New, Hacker News are like, yeah, there's nothing really new in this language. It's like this incremental change over the old thing. And it's like, yeah. That's as far as I know, that's all we're going to get is the small incremental stuff. Um, you know, that is the topic of that old Fred Brooks, uh, no silver bullet, uh, essay. And it's very out of date in some sense. Um, but, and I, I cite it a lot when, in, in, when I'm talking on Twitch and I haven't read it in a decade, but, um, yeah, I think it's true. Like, I think he was already right when he said, yeah, we've back then it's like a 30 year old thing now or 40 year old or whatever it's like he was arguing we've gotten these giant uh productivity increases order of magnitude productivity increases in the past by improving these things and he's like the it's called no silver bullet because he thought at that time there was no silver bullet left we weren't there was nothing we were going to find that was going to give us an order of magnitude productivity gain and you know back then the thing people were always talking about is that there would be programs that would write programs for you so you would just tell it what program to write and it would just magically produce the program um we might that was, get that actually <laughs> that was that was the hope for an order of, that was the way you could see getting an order of magnitude but there wasn't anything else obvious that you could do and yeah i don't know i i don't know if i've got to trust the neural net that writes a program for me like that seems a, i've read a very interesting sci-fi book about that that i don't want to talk about now but yes like if we do get programs to write if we do end up with systems that can write programs for us those systems are going the way the world is currently going those systems are going to be deep learned neural nets and given the flaws in those kinds of systems i really worry about something i mean i guess our programs are buggy too and they'll just be producing bugs weirder edge cases than we would produce edge cases on but yeah that just seems frightening to me but yeah let's probably not rat hole on that um so yeah that was your question uh right. did you have an opinion on are, are, are yeah, we at the I limit well, I think so. I mean, I hope not. I, But, like, everything that I've read post-Dykstra has been more or less regressive. And it's like, yeah, JAI, maybe J, maybe programming in JAI is 50%, 25%, 50% faster, but it's certainly not an order of magnitude faster. Yeah, so I, I don't – maybe not. I, I only expect it to be, like, 10% better experience. Um, and that's partly because I have like the stb.h stuff that has brought C up a lot higher for me, um, right? And that was the whole thing I was talking about with the the Jeff Roberts using the um, the map and the the stretchy buffer um, that he was kind of saying he felt like he had that kind of it's not necessarily an order of magnitude or even a doubling of of productivity or whatever, but. Um, Maybe it actually is for John, for him. It might actually be a doubling of productivity because he tended to rat hole on optimizing things. And part of the experience for him has been letting go of optimizing everything um, because you don't need to because C and computers are fast. Um, so, but yeah, for me, I don't expect a doubling from anything. I think the SCB.H might have been a doubling for me um, for small programs, maybe not for larger programs. Um, I think the, for me, I think it was a doubling not necessarily the library itself, but the technique of how the library was made. Mm. I think that probably doubled my productivity. Do you think a 100,000 line program you would have written twice as fast, though? A 100,000 line game? Um, no, but no. Yeah, but I mean, all of the so that's all of the support tools and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like, my current game has 22 programs. Hmm just to support its development, right? Like and, publishing, and those... 
code signing, asset checking, all this shit. There's 22 programs, and all of those reference a single file that takes care of all of the common case, all the common code between them. Yeah, that saved months. So you think you doubled? We're hand wavy. You think you doubled your productivity on those programs? Oh yeah, for sure. And that's yeah, more yeah. than doubled my productivity on those programs. And that's probably 25 percent of my time budget on this game so far. All right, so that's interesting um, because a doubling is huge. Um, so I don't want to the the silver bullet. I think was arguing about basically orders of magnitude, and and I do want to say that I do think the stb.h stuff especially just those two core things, probably did double my productivity in C. Because at the time I did those, leading up to those, I was writing my own language because I wanted a new language for writing those kinds of smaller programs in. I didn't care about writing a new language for writing games in because games are large and C seemed adequate for that. But I wanted a new language for writing small programs in. And so I really do think, yeah, like a doubling of productivity for small programs. Um, it, it's like that example I gave about the sorting, the anagrams in the dictionary where, you know, I was a 15 or 20 line program and probably would have been a hundred line program or something like that. Those don't, the amount of productivity, like it doesn't multiply in the same way. But um it's probably actually more exaggerated because there's gonna be a lot of bugs in those hundred lines. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, so yeah, like I definitely got, uh, I, but but to some extent, that's the same productivity everybody else got by going to Python, right? Like, um, it's but the difference obviously. I, I'm not trying to say it's there's not no advantage to it being in C. Obviously, it's it's often faster or whatever. Um, but to be fair, like the rest of the world got that that kind of productivity gain they did get by going to things like Python and. I'm actually uh, not convinced Perl, about that productivity gain because the rate at which there seems to be new frameworks and new languages, the learning, the just the 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 upfront cost to learn all of these new things just seems prohibitively expensive. Like it can't actually be more productive when you have to learn a new framework every six months. Well, the frameworks are pretty specific to the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, like people writing 50 line programs in Python are not confronting that stuff. They're not all learning new frameworks. They're not learning new languages. They, somebody out there picked Python and stuck with it and got the productivity gain. Well, I've heard the Python 2 and 3 are like drastically different. But Yeah, but they just stuck to Python 2 or something. The people okay. who did get caught on the upgrade tread, tra treadmill, yeah, they're fucked. Um, like, but th I'm sure there are people out there who aren't that dumb um, who are advantageously using Python. I, th I mean, this I'm is just, certain there are too. But... This is a little bit of a difference in our philosophy, at least our philosophy of our public statements and streams, is that I try to be a little more open to the possibility that other people know what they're doing and aren't total idiots. Um, I, I am not open to other people. Yeah, and, 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 and we're just going to have to accept that in this podcast that we'll have that will express these things differently. Um, I, 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 but, but, but to be honest, I'm just joking. Like I am obviously, right? It's just nothing I have ever seen indicates that any of yeah, these yeah. things are good ideas. But if somebody proves me wrong, I would love love it, please. Well, I, you know, John Blow had, gave a talk. Boy, I talk about John Blow's talks a lot, don't I? He gave a talk where he was complaining about all the programmers at Facebook or whatever and how crappy the uh, – the output of what Facebook and Twitter produce. And so his conclusion was those people just don't know how to code. And, or the, the entity, the company as a whole doesn't know how to code or something like that. And that is, I do not, I do not trust that I understand the problem they're facing well enough to make that judgment call. Um, and, you know, maybe in private, I would be willing to go out on a limb and say they're probably all idiots. But on the public stream, other than the statement I just made, on the public streams, I generally try um, in an honest, not, not, not out of like a deceptive thing, but, you know, like I'm trying to be supportive and a little less cynical. Um, and, well, and, I don't think all pe and I don't think all people are brainwashed idiots. So there are reasonable odds that some of the people there know what they're doing and uh, well, are Yan, doing... Well, Yan Collette is at Facebook, right? Like, uh, uh, there is definitely smart people at Facebook. But it's, not, it's, but not just that, but they're... Division. But not just that, but that they're doing the things that they're doing for good reasons, not just for 
oh, the institution fucks them and that's why the whole thing's... Like, one way of getting away from blaming all the programmers is to say, well, institutionally they have a problem. And it's not... Because, like, they're problem solving problems at scale. Like, the example, the obvious example with something like Twitter is Twitter needs to handle both the case of a tweet that a million people see and a million tweets that one people see. It has to handle both of those cases efficiently. And a lot of people, when they're talking about these problems, don't know anything about distributed systems. I don't know very much about distributed systems and just kind of don't even indicate even the vaguest awareness that that sort of problem exists. Like in John Blow's talk, it's not clear that he's aware of that problem. He's a smart guy, so he's probably aware of that problem and has already discounted it and isn't saying anything. It just isn't mentioning it in his public discussion. But it it makes his arguments weak because they because those kind of issues don't seem to be addressed. So I so because it's those arguments are so weak and stuff, I of don't make them publicly and I don't make them privately. I, I was, I was half joking when I was saying all that stuff about, I don't say what I say privately is different from what I say in the stream. Like, um, I might, it's more like that you're all, everyone's racist, you know, deep in your heart, you're racist, but you, you don't just toe the line in your words. You toe your line, toe the line in your words and deeds because you know, you're wrong deep down to be racist. You just have, Everything about you acts non-racist in all the best ways that you can, but you can't help the little kernel in you that was trained to be racist. Um, so in that same way, I'm racist against the Facebook programmers in that same way. I do think they're idiots deep, deep down, but it's just this kernel that I don't believe in. I don't trust it. I think it's garbage. Like, if somebody proved to me that all the Facebook programmers were garbage, I'd be like, oh, okay, they're all garbage. But well, I, I, think, I don't go into it. I think there's it, empirical evidence that. that there is an institutional problem. And I think there's empirical evidence that they are on average garbage. I think some of the best programmers in the world probably work at Facebook, but like they also have 10,000 of them, right? There just isn't 10,000. You're just not going to get 10,000 good people on the same project. It's just not possible. Not every, not 10,000 people, 10,000 really, really good programmers are not going to be interested in working with that scale of project, right? Most good programmers are not going to be wanting to work on it, right? So I just think it's like a, a fact, like a provable, demonstrable fact that Facebook and those types of problems are not going to get all of the best programmers. But there are sure. very, very smart and very good programmers at Facebook. Well, but but it's different to say good programmers, great programmers, and idiots, you know, or have no clue how to program, can't program their way out of a paper bag kind of comments because like a lot of software engineering practices and even oop is uh, seems to exist in part to allow programmers who aren't that great to make forward progress on a large team okay that's fair that seems to me and so it, they practice these practices and you have all these non-good programmers non-great programmers making forward progress and eventually the app gets done and you ship it and it has more than 65,000 classes in it um, and you can point at this more than 65,000 classes as empirical evidence that they're, it's a bad program or, you know, whatever, however you want to phrase that stuff. But if in the end it gets the job done, it's like, I don't, I don't have enough innards to that. Like I wouldn't ever want to deal with a program that has 65,000 classes, but I'm not sure I can say a priori and it's not 65,000 classes. I think it was 65,000 methods. There was this whole story. No, about I, think how they had, 60, I think they, it was there was a whole story classes. about how they had to patch over the thing that was the function, the ob Objective C method dispatch, or something like that. I think it was, um, and I think it was actually methods, not classes. I think it has five thousand classes, though, or something. It's still an insane number of classes, but the patching thing was because some number was exceeded. And I think it was the number of methods globally. Um. Anyway, right, let's let's get out of that rat hole, but. Um, uh, I don't want to spend my day defending Facebook programmers, but I think um, our peer group has a very um, know-it-all attitude towards classes of programming that we know very little about. And I think that's certainly true. And and so I try, and I'm okay with you and John Blow and me uh, or whatever denigrating them. Um, like I'm not morally offended, but I just try to be a little more cautious about. Well, I don't really know anything about that, so I'm going to try to not do that. And I probably in the past was not very good about that. I probably have said Facebook programs are shit five years ago, but I'm nowadays trying to be a little more careful about that.
I don't I don't use it or know anything about it, so I've actually never specifically said that about Facebook. Yeah, and I, I actually find like a lot of people bitch about Google and Twitter and stuff like that. I, I don't know, they're fine. Like it's fine. I don't really have any major complaints about them. So, you know. Well, the they're, normal I thing never is said, I've never said anything about those programmers. The normal thing is just to say, oh, but there are twenty thousand programmers at Twitter. How is that possible? What the fuck are they doing? Is sort of the normal comment that you get in this. Yeah, but I don't think there's twenty thousand. Well, it's a thousand or whatever the number is, but right. But no, um, no but like the things at scale are are complicated in ways that I don't think a lot of people understand. All right. Anyway, I don't even remember how we got on that tangent. Um, do you remember how we got on that tangent? Nah, but I just read something in the chat. 18,000 classes in the Facebook iOS app. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going back to... back. I'm scrolling back and looking at the questions. <coughs> how often are you able to bring code from an old project into a new project, and how much effort does it take to get work to get to work with the new project? Um, do you want to answer first, or shall I answer first? Yeah, so basically, uh, two years ago, I broke... I purposely broke off from all my old code. And whenever I bring anything over, I make sure it's one file and one file only. And after something has been converted to one file and one file only, it is incredibly easy to bring everything I've ever written across. Um, That's it. Yeah, so um, so the recent history is definitely the same for me. If I want it to be reusable, I put it into an SDB lib. Um, and I may never release it publicly, but it's usually actually... I usually do the extra work to not merely make it a single file library useful for me, but I try to make it usable for everyone. And all of that is mostly selfish because in 10 years, I'll be, no, I have no idea how the thing works either. And so it needs to be as written as much for, for the, the me in 10 years is a stranger as much as anyone else using the library is. So, um, but in the past, the thing I wanted to mention is, um, Almost never, other than uh, the framework that I use for writing games, I have, or the frameworks, because I had like like Lost in the Static was written. It's a GDI thing. It just displays pixels directly through Windows. Um, so I had a sort of one thing for 2D games like that and one thing for things that used OpenGL. Um, I would just, every time I wanted to do a new game, I would copy the old game and then delete everything from the main except for most of the Windows setup. And eventually I was like, why am I always doing this? I'll copy the game into a framework directory and delete everything from that. And then from now on, I'll just copy from the framework directory. And I did eventually do that. But I, then I think I only maybe started one or two more games at, since I made that change. Um, so most of my time has been spent, that's the entirety of the sharing that I would get is I would copy around how to set up a window so that I didn't have to learn how to set up a window or type that by hand every time. Um, and that's it. I didn't try to preserve much else from games um, until I hit on the STB single, hit on the single file library idea. Um, you know, maybe once in a while I would like copy a hash table around or something, but I think, okay, I'm going to totally lie. Um, but I, I bet you in my life I've written a double hashing hash table 50 times because I would just write it from scratch every time. Um, Iggy has probably three separate implementations of a double hashed hash table, just for different types. Like, and I'm not using templates. I'm in C, so I just have to write it three times or whatever. Oh, um, uh, you can do policy based design with macros. You can. Um, I've done it. I have a red black tree. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Jeff had a reusable AVL tree, right? AVL tree that yeah. you just include it multiple times. You include it once for each implementation. So you define a bunch of macros and then you include it. Yeah, that's how and, I do it. I do it for lots of things now, actually. And uh, and that was why I did the 500 line macro instead was because I don't really like that stuff. I, I used to do some stuff that way and I eventually decided I didn't like the multiple includes. They kind of felt clumsy to me. And I particularly don't like that, you know, you could type out the pound defines and not get not know that you had type of them. I mean, you would, I, as soon as you tried to use the thing and it like didn't have a definition, the old definition was there and the types wouldn't match or whatever, you know, you'd, you'd catch it. But it just didn't feel right to me that the... No, at the, the end of each header file, you just force undefined everything yeah, yeah. that could have been defined. It, it didn't feel right to me that it's inexplicit, that, the param that these are effectively parameters to this data type and it's not 
and and it's in this indirected way. <coughs> that's why I chose to make a macro that's a 500 lines that takes an explicit l- list of parameters. So right, that- like I have complete, I'm completely <laughs> on board with the poly- like that book, Modern C++ by Andre Alexandru, who's at Facebook now. If you read it or know it, you know it, right? I I know of it, yeah. Yeah, so that book um, is 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 kind of great and kind of bullshit at the same time, and it's kind of bullshit because it does policy based design through types or through yeah mm. types through the C plus plus metaprogramming system, right? Which is awful, but the idea of policy and his examples of policy based design are quite convoluted and, and bad too because they're all for sort of C++ things like you can have 45 different ways of implementing a singleton right like who cares but for things like uh, common data structures like a hash table a red black tree uh, sort all of these things like do you want stable sort pound defined stable sort then when you if you want a non stable sort the next the, the next time you include it include it all again without the pound defined it is. It, I have found that to be really, really useful, and that's only over the last couple of years. Because I, I, I had the same aversion to it that you had, where it's just like this doesn't feel right. Ah, fuck it, it feels great now. Well, that's a perfect example of the problem that I have, which is that you misspell the stable sort thing, and you get a non-stable sort, but none of your test data actually like happens to hit the bad cases when you're initially developing, and eventually you like far down the road realized that the sort isn't stable and that was fucking you. Um, that's one of the things I don't like about that way of defining the macros. If you forced you right. to always say either stable or unstable explicitly, that would obviously address That it. would solve it. I also, I, I also, I think, always copy and paste anyway because I can never remember what the parameters are, so I yeah. list them all at the top of the file and yeah. then just copy and paste. Um, you know, I, one of the things is that the GL extensions, um, I've use macros to define my GL extensions rather than using one of the libraries to do it. And I used to do it with uh, multiple inclusion. So I would make a, a text file containing a list of all of the extensions that I, uh, extension functions that I wanted in, in some kind of macroized format and then include that in multiple places. And in one place that would define the, uh, the function types and in one place that would define the global variables for the function pointers, and in one place that would fill out the function pointers. So, so wait, wait, do you mean like an X macro type thing? An X macro? Like where you define like a li- like a macro list and then like just a list of all the things, and then there's an operator on each, and then you define the operator? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you okay, define okay. the operator multiple times, right? Is the yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that shit all the time. Right, well, and so when I was originally doing that, I did that by putting the list of things the list of X macros, I guess, um, not, not in another macro, but just a plain flat list in a, in a, an inl file. And then I would include that inl file in three different places to get the list instantiated multiple times. That's fucking great. (laughs) And, and now I take that exact same list and I put backslashes at the end of all of them and define a single macro that contains all of them. Instead of including it three times, I now just instantiate that macro three times. It does the exact same thing. Right. right. I just have to add. I have to do more work because I have to add all the backslashes. But otherwise, it's identical. And I've just veered over to a system where I'd rather do that. It's. I think it's that same kind of like the code generation explicitness is like the including multiple times is cute. And I originally didn't have any problem with it. But over time, I was just like, you know, it's just cleaner if I don't have to have another file. And I just, you know, can do it in line this way and not have the multiple includes. Um. So again, like I mean, yeah, I wouldn't do the inline thing like you said. I do do it as this sort of standard macro thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but for the other thing, it's like imagine there was STB hash, and you just like this is doubly hash. This is you know you pound define STB hash. Uh, fuck, I don't know Robinhood pound define STB hash max size or whatever your re- your uh, yeah there's... whatever it is. There is all stuff, of the parameters you could have. There is stuff like that in SDB right now. Um, I can't even think of them offhand, but there are a few that have some config variables, and they define an STB static uh, thing that you can do that forces all the fi- functions to be static, which allows you to instantiate it several times in different C files because there's no there's no way to uh, I've forgotten the word um, 
to change the names to you know um sure there is no, 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 in in my header files, there's no there's no system for appending a different, you know, a, a oh, tag, yeah, yeah, appending a, a unique a, a thing that will make each one unique. There's no way to do that the way I have them set up. But you can in multiple C files instantiate copies of them and then wrap them in global names that you have affixed a, a prefix to or something um, to right. distinguish them. So it's possible to do it in the STB libs, but I haven't made that like an. Uh, I haven't put the effort, for example, to automatically adding the prefixes because then you have to wrap all of your function names in macros and the, they no longer look like regular functions. And I just don't like that. Like I like to be able to read through the code and not have the names of functions wrapped in macros because now they, their syntax no longer matches the the cliche idiomatic syntax for a, for a, a function definition. Right, yeah, yeah. it's got some extra parentheses in weird places, and so that just slows down my reading. So I'd rather not do that. So, like, if I thought it was an important thing that you needed to do all the time, then I would go ahead and do that work and add that ability. Um, the STB sprintf, which Jeff wrote, uh, actually has that facility uh, because he put it in, and I was like, I'm not going to take it out. He did the work, but um, <laughs> but I I would I would never do it, but. Um, so uh, I don't even know what we were talking about. Well, the same, I was just saying I only do that for things that are explicitly meant to be used for multiple types, like different hash yeah, tables, okay, right, different. Yeah. And like I said, and like I said, I just don't have enough of those. I have the tree and the hash table that I did the ugly macro thing. Um, and in hindsight, I think Jeff has an approach to it that uh, is maybe better, like the. Um, uh, this is not maybe exactly what Jeff did, but the basic idea is that the hash, um, the hash uh, table needs, like if you were doing it in C++, with, uh, this was a whole thing I never commented on back when we were talking about this, what, what the parts of C++ you do use. Um, the, if you were using C++, you could do operator overloading to get you comparisons. Um, you, for hashing, you just need equality comparisons. Um, and you need a hash function. And you could do that with C++. You could have a virtual method or you could use templates or whatever to expose the hash functions. And in mine, right, I'm writing this thing that's a generic hash thing and you have to pass in the hash function to it. Um, but it's a macro, so it expands out and it can inline all that stuff and it can do the hash table efficiently. It's not like QSort where you're passing in a function that has to get called at runtime. And Right, I actually, I wrote the dumbest QSort just to test how much that overhead was, and it was quite significant, where I used a um, a macro and then did it with the multiple include thing, yeah. and my QSort was like 60 or 70% faster than the C1, and it was the dumbest implementation of QSort you could possibly do. The, too. It was faster just because the no, 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 the overhead of the uh, inline. SDB.h does actually have a QSort, uh, a templatized QSort in that same way. It's a ma big macro. Um, and yeah, I think it was 2x faster. And yeah, it was, it was quite significant. I was like blown away it, it, to the it point was, where I was like, well, I need to write my own sort library now. It was it, it was 2x faster eight years ago or whatever. I mean, who knows on a modern machine? And um, I was like, you know, that's not enough that I care about it. I mean, it's, a, it's <laughs> enough like, to be interesting. <laughs> it's enough to be interesting. And it's still in stb.h, but I never remembered to use it. Um, it's just a little more cumbersome to use than the QSort uh, because I have the QSort helpers that make QSort easy. And for most things, that's just never um, big enough. For most of the things I do, right? I, especially in when I'm writing a small app that I'm going to run once and it's going to take five seconds. And it's like right, maybe right. maybe at one second of that is the QSort. And so the half second difference is not worth the half second of my – it would take me more than a half second to switch the – the sort implementation, so it's not worth it. And you know, there are other cases. Obviously, there are cases of programs that are run hundreds of times, or it's part of a game. Then it starts to matter more. And that's just more a matter of the fact that I've never gotten used to it. I, I don't need to deploy it usually, so I'm not even. I don't even really remember that it's there. I only remembered it's there when you said you implemented one, and I was like, oh wait, I did that. Um, it's also not. Uh, it's a bad Q sort in that it's the adversarial thing. It can go into the n squared thing. The, oh yeah, the, mine could too. Which yeah. Terrible. Whereas the C plus plus sort does have that correct. They have the well, the C the C plus plus sort is actually not Q sort. Yeah, C plus plus is inso sort. Right, which is which is like Q sort with a finite right. depth. Um, and, and I was Jeff was writing his own sort, and um, 
spent a lot of time. You know on about this. American flag sort? No, uh, let's not go into weird sort. Um, <laughs> The, the Jeff was writing his own sort and spent way too long on this and was like, oh, I better fix the adversarial case. And he did and all that stuff. But it was this giant mess where he was like, in the end, he really didn't beat the, the – he beat Q sort, but he didn't really beat the standard sort. Um, I think it was like, well, if you have a lot of duplicate items, then his was faster than Q sort. You know, not Q sort, faster than standard sort. Or, and, you know, maybe he was like – three percent faster than standard sword or something like that but the upshot of it was hey they did actually do the correct real work in whichever implementation of standard sword he was looking at well that's so, the thing is when i wrote i wrote i spent a little like months on this just in my spare time writing better sorts and it's just like beating the c plus plus sorts really fucking hard yeah it's really quite quite good so anyway, uh, that was all. I think we were answering the question about bringing code from old projects to new projects, and we kind of rattled into the. Oh right. File so, lives. but one quick thing: before I was doing single file, uh, starting in two thousand and four, I started writing a game engine that I was ostensibly going to use for every project, right? Which obviously that doesn't work. But like at that point, I had like thirty or forty files, right? Like I had a vec two file, a vec three file, all my math files. Like it was brutal. And yeah. now it's just like having everything in one file is just like like I have a I I cop I include my platform library I copy and paste like fifteen lines of code. I have OpenGL initialized. I have a game loop. I have an init function. I have a config function to configure the platform. Everything automatically gets called. The win main gets called, and my game loop just starts. And OpenGL just works. And that's like and it's like literally twenty five lines of code that I have to copy, and it's the best fucking thing ever. It's like just just one file makes everything amazing. Yeah, um, I've I've mentioned before on stream that I have a new OpenGL framework that I'm going to be switching to, um, that is a single file lib format. Um, like that replaces SDL. No, I mean, I, if you're interested I, in mine, mine replaces SDL and it also abstracts like. IO completion ports versus ePoll on Linux and all of that shit. Yeah, I mean, I'll go down that path eventually, probably. But like right now, I don't generally port my games to lots of platforms. And the main thing it's doing is providing the OpenGL um, uh, the whole thing, the whole core versus compatibility context stuff. You know, okay. you have to you have to query the context. There's this whole mess to like get a debug context and. Um, that none of my framework stuff we're doing. And then, you know, you can ask for a core context and people care about that more. And like on the Mac, the, you you can either get a really old compatibility context or you can get a new core context and you don't get both. And so the main thing that this has is that like, it provides all those facilities. So you can just query whichever version of OpenGL you want and you can just get it. And then the big, big part of the library that's not done yet is I'm basically re-implementing all of, a, a large subset of the compatibility, the old immediate mode rendering and um, oh, so you're implementing some immediate of fixed function. Rendering. I'm implementing all that on top of core myself. Not okay. not fix, fixed function. I'm not going to do. Um, it's going to. I'll I'll have like some trivial fixed function e shaders or something built in, but it's not going to do all fixed function. But doing so immediate how would mode you do the fixed function, just like in, write the actual shaders in the thing, and then just. Switch yeah, it's, those? it's already got two shaders built into it, which are do do a blit and uh, I can't remember what the other one is. One does a one does a pixel to pixel blit, and one does a scaling blit and recolors or something like that. Um, it has the, there's an STB Easy Font library, which is a way to really easily do text rendering. That's crappy text, and that's built in, and so it can like built in display the frame rate. Um, by using yeah. that the built in shader. I've got I've got one I wrote one of those too, same sort of thing. And and just has a built in debug print kind of thing or whatever. Yeah. Um so uh and it has some weird stuff because of the application I was using it for. You can call a function that binds a key to mean zoom and then when you press the key it shows you a zoomed box of wherever the cursor currently is. <laughs> so um, you're you're keeping track of, of like you're internally keeping track of some sort of a projection matrix. Well, no, it's just of the screen. So it just uses a shader. The shaders bypass the projection matrices and stuff anyway, right? So it just uses that blit, scaling blit shader to scale up oh, a certain okay, region okay. of the screen. Um, 
And it's just as a, I was like, I was doing some detailed rendering and I really needed this functionality of, can I look at, because I'm running, I have bad eyesight and I'm running on a 2600 by, 2650 by 1600 monitor that's, you know, however, 20, 30 inches, whatever it is. And which is just means the pixels are really tiny and I just can't see what the individual pixels are doing. So I really, and I really needed to see what was going on in this thing that I was doing with some character rendering, text rendering. And uh, so I needed this feature and I'm like, well, why don't I just put it in the lib? Because it might be re useful for other things to do it. So I'll write right. it in a way that is generic because it sounds like a generic thing. Once you already have a framework. So one of the other things the framework already has is this idea that um, your canvas size and your window size are different. Like you're like, for this game, I just want to render it 800 by 600 and you scale it up for me or scale it down or whatever. You, you meaning the framework. Um, right. And so I already had this idea of rescaling the screen. Um, and so I was like adding in a zoom thing that rescales part of the screen was really easy. Um, and I was like, yeah, if, if it's my framework that I use for writing small little open gel things, yeah, one of those I might need to want to zoom in. So let's just have this in there. And it's not hard coded. You have to enable it. You have to ask. I intercept this key and do that with this key and you'll never see that key again. Or you, I think it still gives you the key as well and you have to ignore it yourself. Um, uh, so, you know, it's not, it's only intended for debuggy kind of stuff. But anyway, so the idea is to maybe put some helper features like that in that are kind of esoteric, but don't hurt. Um, I was, the other test app that I started writing was, uh, was, you know, just looking at some terrain. And so I just need the basic mouse keyboard movement. And so I wrote helper functions that generate the, um, I don't think they generate the matrices, but it like tracks the mouse movement for you and gives you Euler angles. And you can just ignore them. It's just always doing this. Like, just the right, framework right. is like, oh, I'm keeping track of some Euler angles for you if you want them. Um, and that makes the easy those apps really easy to write, and you just ignore that extra data if you don't care. But anyway, so that's been my focus. It could eventually supplant all the rest of SDL, but right now it just does creates windows and does that other stuff. And in my old library that for this stuff, I had like, oh, you can create multiple windows, and, you know, it has to do a... Windows function for each one or however that works. I don't even fucking remember. And, you know, you have to tell it which window you want to interact with in the function calls to it, but there's a default global one so you can pass null for everything and get the default global one. And the new thing, I'm like, there's one window. Um, and just get rid of having that parameter. And occasionally you want to write an app where it's like, well, I really want a pop-up dialog that is a separate window. And it's just, yeah, you're fucked if you're using this framework. Don't use this framework for that. Um, so, you know, I'm not, whereas SDL does try to cover all those bases. The SDL wants to do everything. And I'm like, eh, I'm just going to do the things I care about the most. So it is going to replace SDL in the sense of OBB, OBBG uses SDL. But everything else I've ever done doesn't use SDL. They just all use my little dumb framework, my own little, it's actually an STB lib that wraps Windows messages and turns them into internal messages. And, um, right. And, and But I've never really, like, sat down and solved that problem until now. And so now it's my replacement for that old system and for some of the boilerplate I still had to have in my code, like, uh, creating the window and stuff. Um, yeah, my but, bit, and, my bit, sorry. So the point is, is that I, it is so that I don't use SDL, like, clearly. Like, so it is replacing SDL in that sense. But it doesn't have the vast majority of the function SDL has at this point. And I don't make lots of hunt, of shipping games so i'm not sure i want yours that has a bunch of other stuff and that is ported to lots of platforms like maybe mine turns into yours in the end and i'll regret it but <laughs> it will that's the thing is like when i did mine i was like oh it's just gonna be simple right and then like three months later i was like fuck it i'm taking like casey's approach for like in his talk on uh implementing apis he talked about like you know, you start off here and you want to get to here and there's all these little points in between and you want to try to fill in all those points. I basically took that approach to the, the extreme. It does everything from like the simplest, create a window and draw something and in five minutes less, and in, in 30 seconds you have a full functioning OpenGL app to my entire game and my game server and my game master server, which outputs HTML and, and does encryption and all of this shit and all of my tools. They're all written in this exact same thing. And they have various degrees of how crazy, like, you hook into the implementation. Yep. So I went, like, fucking all out on it. It's pretty good. Um, shall we move on? And one to, final. <laughs> shall we move on to more questions? We've been doing questions for an hour already. Um, because 
Sure, I don't care. I have to go in 45 minutes. That's, how, right. that's how much time I have. So. All right, well, let's try to not rat hole as much because uh, there seem to be a lot of questions. Well, um, we always have next month. Yeah, and we, and we don't have to answer all of them. But um, So, okay, old project. Um, so, a quick answer. Any resources you recommend for physics body simulation? Me? No. Physics and body simulation? No. I think he means. I think he means rigid body simulation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we can just stop no. there. No. Well, I mean, I think everybody should read or have Christopher Erickson's Real Time Collision Detection. Yeah, but that's not so much about the physics and just no. About the but collision, you should right? have it. if you're asking I, that question. Then I you don't. Have it. I don't actually have it and 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 have never read it. But um, but I know all about collision detection from having picked that up from Osmosis before that book existed. So yeah. Um, it, yeah, you have to have that book. <laughs> well, you don't. You just there's a online site that has every pair of here's how you do intersection detection d- between any pair of things, and it's this big table with one side has all the things and one side has all the other. You know, sphere versus sphere, sphere versus ray, sphere. You know, blah 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 blah. <clears throat> Maybe it's got good stuff on broad phase or something. I don't know. It's got a good. It's good. But anyways, yeah. All right, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> hey, here's a question related. What books do you think all programmers should read? I can list books that programmers shouldn't read, but should read. They're not. Well, you, didn't you have that? What was the C plus uh, plus, the thing that had no, the I policy think, stuff? I, no, I don't think you should read that. Oh, okay. Um, the only you just I thought think, the policy well, idea was good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, um, no. I mean, I I could say something like art of computer programming, or whatever, but like, no, <laughs> not really. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's uh, perhaps here's a here's a perhaps a useful answer. Perhaps, but maybe not, but perhaps if you want to be able to do the things that I do, the things that people ask, Sean, how do you manage to do this thing? Maybe the answer is read all three volumes of The Art of Computer Programming. There's four now. Well, the fourth one is about fucking bullshit. Who cares? Right? That's the it's, com- There's two parts parsers, to it, too. But it parsers, the second part. parsers and compilery stuff, I assume. Is that what that uh, I can't read it from here. It seems to be what it's about. Well, the point it's is, I didn't, there. I didn't read them. So, and I'm still where I am. So, if you want to get to where I am, you read the three. Maybe that's useful. Um, all right. Have any of you used the Intel compiler? I haven't used it. The Intel compiler, no. Okay, great. We move on. Easy. I've used their other tools, but not the compiler. The giant, giant question with a quote of, from Gabe Newell that I'm going to ignore. I skimmed okay. it, and I was like, I don't know. Serious question. <laughs> I've recently gotten interested in making emulators. I've been suggested to make a chip 8 one first, but what would be a simple real console CPU whatever that I could make next? I have no idea. 68,000. Hmm. Okay. It's the best fucking assembly language ever made. I have had more joy programming 68,000 than probably any other assembly language. I just don't know <laughs> that I'd enjoy making a CPU emulator for that because then there's nothing to run on it without a lot more infrastructure to actually like what's a 68,000 machine that you could then go emulate once you wrote the 68,000 oh compiler. I don't yeah yeah like do you want to get Mac boot ROMs I mean uh, like so yeah I well, mean that the wasn't Apple, the Apple that II was 68,000 right Apple 2 was 6502 but but the Mac the original Mac was 68,000 um right. But yeah, I mean, if just answering his question, sure, that's valid. I just don't know how much value he'll get at the end once he's got a working 60,000 emulator, 68,000 emulator, and he writes the three-line assembly program and emulates it correctly and goes, okay. So, but yeah, if that's what he wants to do, the 68,000 is definitely, I did do a little 68,000 program. It is definitely a clean CPU design. Uh, Java runs at good speed, whatever. Is there a speed difference between C++ and C? No, not really, unless you use C++ badly, which everyone does. Um, not everyone does. You don't use it. Like none of our, the, what I keep calling our peer group does. Um, but if you do OOP, you probably hit a speed difference. You definitely hit a compile speed difference, which I probably care about more personally. Yeah, compile speed is a big thing that people don't really take into consideration. Turnaround time is like directly correlated with happiness. Have you ever looked into some of the newer, lower level languages like Rust or Nim? And if so, what do you guys think of them? I have not. Not really. Just, um, just reading things that get posted to Hacker News, get halfway through, and then be bored. Uh, somebody's <laughs> asking about what graphics cards we use. I don't even know, and I don't care. Some NVIDIA, because n nice. 
Uh, somebody's being helpful, but he tagged me and I didn't need to be tagged on it. Oh, now here's a long block without any question. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm, uh, once again, I'm just going to say these and reject them, but then you're free to not unreject them if you want to. How do you feel about C++ auto? I don't care because I don't program in C++. I think I think it's pretty bad. Um, I think it solves a problem that C++ has, which is... An artificial problem you know, created by C++. Crazy template. Crazy yeah, template yeah. definition. Right? Well, I mean... Just like, I, don't have that problem and then you don't need it. Well, I, so here's a, a thing I will say is that Jai has type inference. And from using ML, which is the sort of canonical type inference language back in the day, um, when I was trying to make a programming language for myself for small programs way back before I made stb.h, as I mentioned previously, one of the things that my language did have was type inference. Because I, I was like, yes, you can do this thing where the types, when the types are simple, you don't have to explicitly type them. It's pretty obvious in the code. What, they, what types there are. And so it's just less code to read, so it's probably going to be easier to maintain. Um, so I did I did not think type inference was a bad idea back when I was writing that language. However, I eventually hit the 2x performance productivity in C without ever having to finish my language, so I dropped my language. So the type inference that Jai has is perhaps, that's part of the reason why I might think Jai is a better systems programming language. It does have the type inference. It is optional. You can have full type notations. Um, uh, I'm concerned about the rigorousness of his type inference because um, it type, real type inference is a hard problem and I don't know how he approached it. And I'm concerned that the definition of his language is going to be whatever his implementation does rather than it being definable separately. Uh, in, in specifically in the case of type inference. Maybe he chose his type inference in a way that was very explicit. Like C++ has a very specific type inference rule, whereas ML has a very complicated type inference rule. Um, well, not very complicated, but it, there's this whole thing called unification where you have to make a tree of types and map this or graph of types. And you have two graphs of types and you have to map them to each other and resolve the types in them. There, it's That's part of the ML type resolution process, um, which is why you can get grotesque type errors from ML. And uh, even though ML is basically a very simple bottom-up type inference, and C++ tries to use a very, very simple rule and avoid that stuff, as my understanding. And I assume that's what he's doing in Jai, but I've never looked, and I don't know. Like, how how easily the type is inferred from the right hand the type of the left hand side is inferred from the right hand side so that's a thing to be cautious about in type inference but it is a thing i do not object to in principle and um if that problem is avoided if if you have a uh coherent rule for how the type is inferred that is objectively and separately defined from a particular implementation um i think it's probably a positive there is a well, downside I think, only, I think it's only a positive in I, I actually don't agree that it's really that big of a positive. The only positive that I see is it's less typing. But in C, you still or C++, you still have to type the word auto. So I actually don't think yeah. it's actually that. Well, yeah, and I'm only talking type, type inference in general. Yeah, in C++, it's, it's an advantage in C++ because it's solving that problem that C++ induced on itself, the, the ugly template stuff. Um, which the auto is way shorter than the type you would have to type. So clearly yeah, it's okay. valuable for C++ if you're coding that way in C++. But once you're not coding in C++ that way, it's not that valuable. In Jai, it does save, you know, it's a single character. It's, it's simply the omission of the type. If he sticks with the syntax, that which was the syntax I suggested, um, because it came from my language that I had written for this, um, you omit the type literally and you don't put any extra characters in. Um, well, just the colon, right? Yeah, well, the, the whole thing is that you need the colon equal anyway in the syntax, and therefore you leave out the type between the... Normally the type goes between the colon and the equal. Right, so right. by simply omitting it, you get the type inference. So Yeah, um, I think that's great. So, uh, yeah, I think that's fine. The only question is, it does have a possibility on the maintenance that when you're looking at code, it's harder to understand the code because you can't see the types there. Right, and I feel like in a lot of circumstances, you know what the types are and it's straightforward, but I could be wrong about that. It could be that when you come back to maintain that five years later, you'd really have preferred it to have explicit types. Um, but I do think it saves more than just the typing. It's when you're reading that code, if you do under, know, if you can tell easily what the types are, when you're reading that code, there's just less stuff going on visually and it's easier to read the code. That's my feeling is that it's more than just saving the typing, but who knows? 
All right, are we done with that? Should we move on? Yeah, it's pretty Twitch is, simple. The Twitch web client is being really shit on me. I'm looking at the scroll back, and it keeps scrolling. It's supposed to be paused because I'm scrolled back in the scroll back, and it keeps advancing it anyway. So I keep Do you have losing... focus on that like sub window? Yeah, it's. I don't know why it's doing it. It's just I'm losing my place. Like, like what? Why? Maybe you're all the way back, and it's scrolling off the screen. No, now. no, it's not. It's just I don't know what it's doing. Okay, there. It's how do I feel about C++? Okay, here's a big question. Let me skim it. I don't care. Okay. Although he ended it with pound feels bad man, just so he knows that that's the question I don't feel like answering. <laughs> uh, okay, that was a whole bunch of commentary on some stuff we talked about half an hour ago. Okay, maybe people haven't been asking questions lately. Rigorous Fabian said no, directed at me, but I don't know what he was directing it at, and it was probably 15 minutes ago, or maybe it's five minutes ago. So, um... Oh, actually, there's one more thing I just thought about now that sort of ties together a couple of topics. We were oh, oh, about. oh! I, I know what it is. It's what the fourth book of uh, of oh, uh, computer oh. programming is. It's combinatorics is what the fourth volume okay. is about. Um. Let me, so let, me, I was gonna say, let me just sorry? Finish catch, let me finish catching up. I'm almost there. Okay, okay. I'm always ca caught up to now. I think the original Mac was 65, 8, 16, not 68,000. Yeah, we met the 68,000 family. We didn't really, we were really yeah. trying to name the processor. Just a bunch of them. Which of you is Nothing's 2 and what is the Twitch name of the other? Uh, sorry. So nothing. Somebody already is... answered it below that. Oh, okay. Then I don't care. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was important, but if it's already answered, there. Oh yeah. 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 Um, this was I claim C is faster than C plus plus. Who gives a shit? Auto solves problems. These aren't none of those rest were directed at me. Everyone's talking to Fabian. Okay, great. So what were you going to say? What, what were you? So going I was going to say, say um, uh, we were talking about. Before somebody asked, or, or we were talking about our, our our peer group and in general, people just say just do the simplest thing possible, right? And then I got onto the or we got onto the tangent about sort, and I and and the reason why I had to write a sort is because an algorithm that I was using uh, to solve some geometric problem required a priority heap, and I looked at it, and I figured, well, you don't or a, uh, I don't need a prior or priority queue, I guess. I don't need a priority queue because I could just sort the list every time. And if I wrote a really fast sort, I could probably write a really fast sort in a little bit longer than it would take to write a reasonable priority queue. So that's probably a better use of my time. And then I could reuse the sort on a whole bunch of other things. So I did that. And I actually think it was the right, right choice in that situation. So, and that's another example of doing the simplest thing possible. Like you could use a priority queue or you could just sort every frame or as often as you need to. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I that's... that was a, an interesting, I, I, I sort of roundabout kind of do the simplest thing that I've done recently. Well, and in fact, like, it depends on, like, how your priority queue is updated, right? You can just linear search. You can just store them all unsorted and linear search it. Um, like, that, if, if you do it, if you do an update every time you do a, if, like, if you're inserting and removing from your priority queue at about the same rate, um, yeah. then that means that you're finding the minimum element about as often as you're inserting into it. And if on every insert you have to do a sort, then you're doing an n log n sort on every insertion and removal. You may right. be just better off doing the linear search because that's order n instead of n log n, right? It, right. You might have even gone too far with that. It might be the simplest thing. I will say that... Um, Not the way it was used, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just as long as that's... Clear. Um, yeah, I, I, it oh, totally depends on the algorithm. I just want to mention, because that's an interesting case, that um, I very rarely inter implement the heap style priority queue, but I have implemented it. Um, Iggy2 has that implemented. Um, Was it for the triangulation? No, Iggy2 has it for... Uh, 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 animation for once the next animation event that I need okay. to to update because I, I, I because, use it for my for my triangulation, which is why I asked. Because that's a, a data driven problem that is data set dependent, so different artists can produce vastly different sets of data. So I don't know 
like somebody might produce a thing that has 10,000 pending events I, and that they're updating constantly. I, I don't I, I can't predict it. And so there it's worth. Well, let me go ahead and deploy the right the good data structure for this. Um, the thing is that the place where I encounter the priority queue the most is in doing um, pathfinding or pathfinding style operations, a star search, uh, breadth first search, that kind of thing. Um, I guess breadth first doesn't ha does it have a priority queue? Yeah, breadth it does. first. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It needs a priority queue if you have very have differing weights, and um, because you need the you need the decrease key operation is the important thing there too. Um, but that's Dijk that's Dijkstra's, right? Breadth first is Dijkstra's. Yeah, I don't keep track of the name of that. Like, yeah, okay. there's a different name for like depending on there's like breadth first is if the edge weights are all one, and then Dijkstra is this thing, and then there's something else if you can have negative edge weights or you know some some like that that was that Bellman Ford thing or what I don't even remember right whatever. Um, right. I just I just hand wave those all as breadth first search. They're conceptually doing the same kind of thing. I just so, call but, everything Dijkstra's. So yeah, the Dijkstra thing. Um, there's this classic solution, uh, classic trick that you can use, which is if all of your edge weights are integers and they're all small integers, like bounded, you know that all of your edge weights are one to eight, let's say, um, then you can keep eight cues, um, one for each possible integer weight at the wavefront. So you're like, currently you're distance 13 away. And so that means any node out of your node that's weighted at that's at cost 13 is going to be 13 plus 1 to 13 plus 8 that is the possible range of them um so actually you need nine priority queues so you you need a priority queue that has a uh, not priority queue queue or, or it's just a, a, a List, stack right. a stack yeah. it, whatever you don't care about the order so you need one that contains all the 13s because 13 is what you're currently processing and then you need all the ones that have the 13 plus 1 to 13 plus 8 so you need 13 up to 21 so you need nine uh stacks um, and those are just order one operations you just push on whichever one and then once you've consumed all the 13s you move on to 14 and 13 is it's a ring buffer the 13 now becomes the 22s um, so you have a ring buffer of arrays or of stacks and okay. um, the you know this doesn't meet like the order the big order n for the general problem like <coughs> If you have floats, you can't do this. Or if you have really sparse, like if the range of your integers is 1 to 100, but your entire data structure only has 100s in it, then you're going to have all these empty um, arrays from, you know, the zero to, 1 to 99 is going to be empty. You're going to have 0 to 100, 200, 300, and you're never going to hit any other ones. But you will have to traverse them all looking for what's the next... What, you know, once you've exhausted all the zeros, and you're like, okay, now let me check the ones. Oh, the ones is empty. Let me check the twos. Other oh, twos is empty, and you'll go all the way up into 100. So, as the range of weights grows, um, you are paying some time. So the cost of the operations on this is it's order n for n uh, priority queue operations. It's order n plus or it's order n plus m, where m is the size of the weights, you know, or something like that. Right. There's if you allow the weights to increase, the thing gets lower. None of that matters in practice. So like the classic thing that I do is I have a grid that I want to pathfind or breadth for search on. And so I want the orthogonal steps to cost one and I want the diagonal steps to cost one point four. Right. Like that's the one point square root of two. Right. Root two, yeah. the so you can approximate as one point four. Um, I go ahead and approximate as one point five. And so once I've approximated as 1.5, I just double them. So my orthogonal costs are two, and my diagonal costs are three. So now I just have two different integer weights, and I can apply that thing I was just saying, and I need four uh, arrays, and they're all order one operations. So they're faster than the heap priority queue, right? They're, the heap priority queue is an n log n, or it costs log n per operation. And this costs order one per operation. So there are a lot of places where it turns out that the theoretical priority queue isn't what you want in practice right actually that's another that's something interesting and worth i think talking about briefly is uh casey had uh well fabian's here he had fabian and, and jeff on he released that video from handmade con and then he had uh charles uh mm -hmm. last week <clears throat> and they were talking about and basically they were talking about compression and basically all compression always comes down to is uh, understanding your data and the probabilistic model of your data and i think that's actually the case for all algorithms in general, right? Because like the, the priority queue example, like my implementation was 
to just to do the quick sort and I or it ended up being American flag sort, but whatever. I did the sort because I knew how often I was going to be sort, sorting versus looking up and I knew what my data range was and I knew all of these things, right? And you just gave the example of using the ring buffer of um, queues over or a ring buffer of stacks over a finite range because you know what your data is and you can actually make a much, much better decision about what algorithm to use just because you know like the distribution and the sort of statistical properties of the data. And I think that's something that's actually really important and not, at least I've never heard it codified or talked about very much is that understanding the statistical distribution and model of your data is more important in almost all algorithm decisions than what I could like this general, like, Oh, you're doing a priority queue. It should be a heap or whatever. Right. Like it's all, it's always better to at least what I have found and not talked about a lot. It seems to be always better to understand the statistical model of your data and then write something that's appropriate to that. And when you start doing like what you were saying, you wrote three different hash tables um, uh, for Iggy it's like, yeah, I rewrite my hash table, not anymore because I have the policy based one, but I rewrite my hash table all the fucking time or used to just because this one I want to use, you know, open addressing or this one I can pack the uh, the index lookup in the, the high bits of the key because I know how big it is and I can use only a 32-bit key or whatever. And there's all these little things that I would do on every single time I would implement it. I would just do something a little bit different because I knew the data a little bit better. And I think that's something that isn't really talked about a lot. At least I haven't seen anybody talk about it. Have you? Well, I think, I think in our again, and our peer group knows it. So it's probably talked about in Handmade Hero. It's probably talked about in Handmade Con. Um, like, there's definitely people who know this, and it should be talked about. But yeah, the academic literature doesn't talk about it. I, I did have this discussion with somebody in one of my ACLU hangouts. Um, I think it was there. It might have been on Twitter. Which is, I, I want to resist that. The way you expressed it is what I think of as an overreaction. I think you need to know both. I think you want to know about distribution of data, and you do want to know all the academic th theory. It's explicitly, what this guy said was like the big O stuff doesn't matter. You know, the the big O was being the academic way of talking about the performance of the different algorithms, data structures. And the thing is, it does matter. Like if your n gets big enough, a lot the argument, and I do see this all the time, regular blog posts just from regular Joe Schmo web programmers or whatever. It's like, hey, pay attention to your n because if your n isn't that big, you don't need to do, do all this crazy shit. Like not everyone, like pl plenty of people are dumb about that, but there are <coughs> perfectly normal programmers who have noticed this problem and are aware of it, which is like, yes, that if your n is small, you don't give a shit about the big O. Um, but I, and so all I'm saying is one step further past that, which is like, you need to know about your n and in, when your n gets big, you do want to know the academic shit. Um, you know, you in the end, in the long run, you always have to measure when you care about performance. You basically nowadays always have to measure the performance of your program. Somebody was asking somebody asked a question that I skipped, which was about how do you measure cash behaviors and stuff? And, you know, I bemoan this. I've gotten out of optimization programming because it feels to me a lot of the time like what you do is you write it three different ways and you measure them. And whichever way is fastest is the way that's fastest. And you can't predict up front which way is going to be fastest. Um First off, like the cache thing or whatever. And, uh, you know, one of the things of that is like the array of structs versus structure of array stuff. It can be a pain in the ass to write stuff both ways unless you're using Jai. Um, and you maybe don't do that work very often. And that's kind of why I've stopped thinking about optimization as much. Why a lot of the work I do doesn't involve optimization is that that's just so painful. In the old days, we could actually kind of model the problem and have some idea. It's like, well, I know this is like going to take like 10 instructions. So it's going to be like 20 cycles per thing. And you know, it's got one memory operation in there that slows it down a little, but it's consistent or whatever. And as the caches have gotten more and more complicated, that, that stuff becomes harder and harder to predict. Uh, in micro benchmarks, you can look at and go, "Oh, well, I know this is going to touch this many cache lines or whatever." But a lot of the times, so you really actually, don't know. I'm kind of, this is, I have a question for Fabian if he's listening. Then, because I'm in the same boat as you, right? Like, fuck it. Like, thinking about like how the cache is going to behave or how things are going to be scheduled on different ports or whatever, or how things are going to be pipelined. Like, I don't care, right? Like, there's no fucking way I can keep that shit in my head and and actually reason about code. But can somebody like Fabian actually? reason about looking at c code i guess you'd have to look at assembler yeah, if you look at, at the assembly, assembly output sorry. yeah he's yeah he's he had to do that for the oodle 
compression. Like, I don't know if you were paying attention to that. You know, we announced these compressors where we're like, oh, we've really pushed the speed space or speed compression trade off. Um, right, but can he reason about the? Co- uh, my so question he, is, can he reason about? So yeah, it? he goes to the assembly and reasons about it, and it's very hard because there are many critical, many in, independent systems in the machine which could all be the critical path, and so he has to reason about that and figure out which one's the critical path, and then figure out how to optimize that. And some of that may be by using VTuny kinds of stuff to measure the the numbers. I don't actually know. Uh, you know, to, to measure the actual counts. And some of it is VTuny style analysis where it just looks at your thing and tells you what what the interactions of the things are. But I don't really know much of the details, but I know he's done that. He's talked about doing it. He's like, oh, I figured out that this uh, processor, the it, you know, claims to ex- to issue three instructions per cycle, but it can only retire. This is totally wrong. And, 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 and but whatever. But it's like, it can only actually retire two instructions per cycle. So it's a total fiction that it can execute three instructions per cycle because it can only retire two anyway. And that's not actually what it was. I'm super oversimplifying because I don't remember the details. And even if I did remember the details, it would involve some parts of the chip that most of our listeners have no idea about. So even that, (laughs) I don't even know if they know about the retirement versus whatever. But anyway, he'll probably correct it in the chat. But even if it it doesn't matter because my point was that's not exactly what he says. But like he has that kind of encounter. In trying to measure it, he realizes that the documentation is not actually is misleading or you know there's some undocumented thing that they haven't mentioned that he's he's able to get to that level where he's like why is this thing not taking the number of cycles that the thing predicts and and narrow down that there's some architectural lim- limitation that's not documented so he's definitely doing some of that stuff um but yeah i i, I have no connection to it and don't really know it's, this is just like discussions over lunch and occasionally tweets it, this stuff shows up but i have lunch with him a lot and so i hear a lot of these stories at lunch yeah, I find it like it's interesting. It's like I used to do like the crazy optimization stuff like back in the '90s, right? Like that was the thing. Like how fast could you get this thing to go? Right now, it's fast enough. Fuck it. And now yeah. it's, it's too hard. You can't. I can't even reason about the CPUs anymore. Right? Like I have no fucking idea what's going on. Yeah, he he just <laughs> described the thing I was describing, but he just described it in a general way instead of trying to use a dumb example. Yeah, um, yeah, I read, I read his, I read what he wrote. But uh, so I want to repeat that out out loud for the archive. So here's what he says. Uh, I need to do some data gathering, but mostly I can tell from looking at the assembly code how long it should take. And then it's usually not the result I get, and then I figure out why it's not the result I expect. So I refine my understanding of the code and my understanding of the processor until prediction and reality agree. So there you go. It's a lot of work for, on modern CPUs and modern systems, very little gain. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that Depends on what you're what you're doing, right? But for our case, at least. Yeah, no, exactly. I was going to say, like, let's say he does this and he's able to get a loop to be twenty percent faster, um, and maybe that makes the whole compression decompression step ten percent faster. Um, right. And then you drop that in a game, and that makes your load time two percent faster. Nobody gives a shit. But uh, when we are selling that to game developers, we can say our compressor is ten percent faster like or decompressor is 10 percent faster that's a substantial thing that they may take seriously um they probably won't do the architecture work necessary to expose that to their user but that's their fault not our fault and um but yeah if i were writing a game i would never put in the work necessary to get a 10 percent improvement in my decompression time because it's not i know it's not going to show up in to the user a 10 percent a 50 percent reduction maybe is worth it you know it's uh, it's all a trade-off um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he says he, it was actually bigger than ten percent. He says he got a one point five x gain. So the speed went from one hundred to one hundred fifty. I assume is what that means. Um, so which you know you can view as like if if we're talking about time, that would mean the time went from one to two thirds. So it's a savings of thirty three percent. And a one point two five x out of over. Oh no, so sorry. That was the sub part. It was one point two five x out of whole code. Codec perf. So that's five fourths invert that that's four fifths. So it's saving twenty percent of the time. I said ten percent. So you know. Well, I mean that that's quite. If you're lo- if you're like a triple A game and your load time is at you know a yeah minute, yeah if you're a triple A game if you're triple A game and your load time is at a minute and that's because of your decompression or you're not doing any compression and you can drop our compressor in and 
and and that doesn't slow you down. Um, yeah, it's definitely worth it. And the AAA game people are the people who will pay enough attention to this to get it right, unless they farm that part out to an intern for some reason. Probably the parts that Oodle is facing are not intern facing. A lot of the things that Rad does are intern facing, which have different uh, constraints and are well, what I'm what I actually I, I find interesting is that Oodle's not trying to sell to Facebookers or they're not trying to sell Oodle to Facebook or something like that because that's where it would be huge, right? That's where a 1% or 2% gain in, which is I guess why like Jan Collette is there. It's like a 1% or 2% gain in, compre- in, in compression is like massive when you're storing petabytes of data. Well, so our business model normally for selling these things you know, is per product or whatever and so it doesn't translate to that market very well. Um, but right. I do know we did look at selling it to somebody um, I don't know. So I, so I know of one thing. So for all I know, we did try or are trying to sell it to Facebook. Um, I know of one large company that we did uh, talk to them about selling it, and I don't know what ever happened with that. It like might still be in progress, or it might have died. I don't know. Yeah, it just it seems like, it seems like that would be a really good case for it, but I don't know. Um, and I was vague about that because I don't remember whether we talked publicly about it at all. I assume we didn't, but. Um. Let's see. Uh, okay, so there, I, there was one question that I skipped way back in chat. Uh, that I didn't mean to skip it. I was like, oh, I'll come back to that in a second. And then I forgot to come back to it. Um, it was a question I didn't quite understand what he was asking, but I, it, it wasn't so far removed from reality that it wasn't worth trying to figure out what he was asking. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, it was just like he phrased something awkwardly or something, and I assumed we could decipher it. Um Where was it? I don't know how far back I need to scroll. I guess I need to scroll back farther. Darn it. What headset am I using? I'm using some Bluetooth headphones and a, a high quality music microphone. Um, it's, it's not a headset at all. Um, but but they're, they're like stereo music headphones rather than a like a like a headset style headphones or whatever. All uh, right, still scrolling back. I swear, I swear I saw this. What? All right, well, I, I'm all the way back, and I never saw the question I was thinking of, so I don't know what. So, what somebody just said L- LZMA is terrible for every case I've seen it in games. I don't think LZMA is terrible. I mean, decompression is, is pretty slow, but it's just it's really good compression ratio and open source, and the library is actually quite nice and it's public domain, and... So what would, you use it, what would you use it for? I wouldn't use it because I just use Brotly, but asset compression. <laughs> for what compression? Say again? Asset compression, like large asset compression. But you don't think the slow decompression would be a problem? Not if you, I mean, I don't know. I haven't benchmarked it versus loading raw data or whatever. But if you just decomp, if like, if you're, if you're distributing a download game or you're downloading like an update or like what I'm doing where I'm, I'm like streaming content off the internet, I care about download like file size a lot right because i could just decompress it and then save it save the decompressed version once right so what else you make is reasonable mm. um or, or quite good um so uh, for the ratio. so the download so it, for the case where you have a download and then install step and you ha- have your installer decompress it yeah yeah or but the, be, my largest, could be the first my largest thing. sorry or it could just be the first thing you, the first time you run, you do it. It's equivalent. Yeah, I, yeah, but, yeah. But I just wanted, but so you could argue that, well, and it's game installer is not what he was talking about by in games, but you know. Uh... Well, at the moment, the largest thing I'm using right now is actually uh, uses bitnet compression because it's granny files, but yeah. Mm. <laughs> Which is fine. <laughs> it's, it seems to be working well. Um, How can this, I swear I should not. I swear it was not before these. It was definitely after these. So I must just be looking for the wrong name when I'm skimming this. Um, or or else he didn't tag me. And I thought he had tagged me and I'd seen a question that wasn't tagged because now I'm only looking at the tagged. Um, that one I definitely skipped intentionally. Or he got banned. I guess he could have gotten banned and now the question is gone. It's uh, conceivable. There's just no questions at all in that range. 
Well, anyway, there's two get... new questions. All right. Well, go ahead. You you can read them. I don't have to do it. Uh, I'm reading this one, but I don't think it, I don't I don't have anything to say about it. But maybe you do. Probably not. What are your thoughts? Well, actually, no. You do have something to say about this because this is something you've talked about. What are your thoughts on AI navigation pathfinding versus physics based movement? And how do you reconcile the two to avoid scenarios like monsters not being uh, able to path to a player? That question. That part of it, I don't think. Like the physics based movement thing is something you've been working on, right? Uh. Uh, you, I can't see it, and I just found the question that I was looking for. So okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, so should I do my this one first? Okay, so yeah, um, I think this is the one. Yeah, the question was: Has the STB library style influenced how you structure file layouts for non-library game-specific code? So I think what he means is: When I'm writing a game, do I lay out my files differently? Do I put things in different places in files? due to uh, what I've learned about doing single file libraries. Um, well, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't even understand your interpretation of the question. So, yeah, um, so let me go specifically. So OBBG uh, has two header files. One header file has all the functions and one header file has all of the data. And you could argue that like maybe the single file library style has is what, that's an experiment. It's an experiment I'm trying. I'm like, oh, let's see what happens if I put all the functions in one header file, all the data in a different header file. And you could say maybe the single header file library idea is what prompted me, or, or, or contributed to me designing, oh, let me just try piling all that stuff like that. Um, that's how I'm interpreting that question, is that that's the kind of thing he means. Okay. So that's an answer. Well, there you go. That's a thing I'm trying, and maybe that was influenced by that. Um, I don't use header files, and I don't really. I just I, the way I think about files is stuff that's kind of related together, and I don't care where things show up in files because I just use Visual Assist X to jump around. So f files are completely meaningless to me. If I so, could put everything in one file and it didn't bog down Visual Studio, I would just do that. So what do you mean by you don't have header files? Are you doing a an include all of those C files into one? Yeah, yeah. You build. It's um, so much faster. It's crazy. Uh, but then you but you don't put everything in a single file just because of the IDE problems. Yeah, at about 15,000 lines, Visual Studio craps out. Okay, because that answers a question that somebody asked in the originally on Twitter that we skipped um, about doing all your programming in a single file. But when, um, you use, when you use Visual Assist X, like their go-to and then their go-to function and then go-to definition and declaration, once you like master how to use that, you get around... It doesn't matter how many files you have. You just get around your whole sure. code instantly. Yeah, it makes sense. So, like, putting everything in one file would be ideal, but you can't. All right. So, uh, so there were the new questions. So, uh, was it the, so was this the uh, the best practices? Is that the question you were? Uh, reading, no, reading I didn't see that. But go go ahead with that. Well, what was the question <laughs> you read? It was about physics-based movement. It was like, what are your thoughts on AI navigation, pathfinding versus physics-based movement? But I don't think those two things are. I'm I'm just not seeing uh, versus. Oh, it's because um, it's a Q. Because he's doing the Q format. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on this? How do you reconcile the two to avoid scenarios like monsters? Oh, it just scrolled away on me. Fuck me. Well, I think I think the two things that he's talking about aren't contrasting with each other but like he asked about physics based movement which I'm kind of curious about how your little experiments because you're doing some experiments with that right um, so <clears throat> I've never seriously done a physics based thing well suck or kind of is but it, then it didn't have any pathfinding um, so yeah I don't think the, I don't think the pathfinding has anything to do with it to be honest but well no I so I maybe there's two separate questions like the pathfinding thing the interesting thing of the pathfinding um, is what I call path following, which is that you've set a path and now your physics system has to somehow follow the path. And the way to cheat that is you don't use the physics system when you're path, finding, path following. You just move the thing along the path. And like when you write a 2D tile-based game, you just do that. That's how a 2D tile-based game works. You find a path that's a sequence of tiles, and then you move the guy along the sequence of tiles, and there's no physics at all. Like, maybe you're allowed to lock a door on the guy, and so you have to check that the, whether the path is clear and that you could think of that as physics, right? But it, that's, it's not really. Um, and so uh, right now in OBBG, the, there's these characters you can drop in the world and pathfind, and they just move along the path without running physics. Well, what do they do? 
Did I run with physics? I don't remember now. I don't remember what I did for that. Um, I think they do run with physics. I think they just try to turn towards the next point. Um, but they, they, their physics is not... They are running in the physics system, but they're directly controlling their velocities. They're not trying to accelerate and decelerate. Whereas, so like in System Shock 1, we had this physics system and the the creatures, and I think Terra Nova had this too. The creatures had controllers on their physics, and so they would not have instantaneous accelerations. Like they had to come to a stop. You know, it was very quick. It was the same as the one that the player used. So it had the feel of the player controls. But they had to come to a stop and they had to accelerate. And that actually interferes badly with the pathfind. If you're pathfinding along a narrow ledge and you just try to follow the path and you don't know there's a narrow ledge there and you like, oh, you came in from this direction so you accelerate and you try to get on the path and you're a game programmer writing this thing so, oh, it overshoots the path and so now it steers back to the path and eventually converges onto the path and it's like a narrow ledge and you fall off the ledge when you try to pathfind along it because the game programmer wrote that pathfind. So there's some interesting thing that goes on in there and if you cheat and you don't use physics... And you, or you do this direct velocity physics and you just go along the fit. You turn off physics and you say, while I'm on this, following this path, I'm turning off physics and I'm just going along the path. Um, you get the perfect path following. But it's not really shippable. It's what's in OBBG sort of, but it's not really shippable. Like they're not, if you do literally what I just said, then they don't collide with anything. You, you know, there's if there's another character on the path, they don't collide with them and that wouldn't work so you really have to run the physics there and so you just need a controller in there that tries to follow the path as well as possible and i so i don't think so that's an interesting problem in the sense of if you look at what i'm doing at obbg um i'm just ignoring that problem but there it is a huge problem that i haven't solved just because there's not enough else going on in the system for it to matter currently the characters don't collide with each other so it doesn't there is no character versus character collision at all so there's nothing there's no reason they can't just follow the paths makes sense to me i ain't got none to add okay um so i'm just going down for more questions but we're at near the end i think here right yeah i could probably do one one more question i got like eight, i got like 10 minutes yeah, that was my question. Pathfinding with 2D tiles, you can just cheat, but in 3D environments, that would potentially look quite weird. So there's another thing that goes on there, which is that uh, a quality improvement in 3D is, uh, and in 2D, if you have full continuous motion, like in 2D, you can have full continuous motion. You don't have to be locked to tiles. And if you pathfind like I'm doing, everything moves along these orthogonal or perfect diagonals. And like, so if something is three units to the right and five units up, you, and it's on, on an open thing. You'd like to beeline directly at it. You don't want to go part way diagonally and then go straight up to it, which is what my system does. Um, and nobody has a good solution. Everyone has a solution that works to this, um, but nobody has solved this problem. Um, the, so the normal thing that you do is you do ray casts, physics ray casts is what you think of them as. It's like, is it do I can I move unobstructedly in a straight line between these two points? And you take your current point and you take all the points that you have in the path in front of you and you say, can I go directly? So I skip my path and just go in a straight line to the thing. And <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and if the furthest query that returns true, you you do that. And then you do that at every point that you step. And so over time, it's an n squared thing. You're doing an n squared set of tests, um, trying to find that. So people use nav meshes instead. And there's this very smart thing you can do with nav meshes, um, which is when you return the path result, you return all the polygons that you cross uh, on the path. Rather than like a line, a sequence of points, you're actually returning all the ground polygons that you traverse. And those ground polygons like tell you how big the ledge is how big the walkable space is. It might be a ledge or a wall or whatever that defines the edge of that walkable space. But you know that you're allowed to go on any line over those polygons. So now you can do your uh, shortcut raycasts directly on these polygons in the nav mesh. And those are much typically going to be much simpler. They're not the world geometry. You're not doing a physics raycast. You're doing this simplified walkability uh, polygon mesh that you're doing this, that 2D mesh that you're doing these 
AI raycasts, walkability raycasts on that allow you to do these short, direct sh shortcuts. But you still have to do those casts. Like nobody has a good solution to, to that problem. And even the nav meshes, I, I critiqued the, the what's, what's his name? Miko um, Minonin um, re raycast, recast? Is it recast? Is that the name of his? He has a nav mesh library and it, it starts by dividing everything up into little squares and then merges them back together into polygons. And then there's a runtime thing that, um, you know, does the thing I just said and returns you the list of polygons and stuff. But he had one demo and I was looking at it and I was like, these guys take a suboptimal route. And he's like, yeah, that's you know, like eventually he, when we drill down into, into it, I mean, I mean, it's blog post. He's like, yeah, that, that, the, that's the nav mesh. The nav mesh happens to have a narrow polygon here and a wide polygon here. And when you try to do the A star, you have to assign some weight to it and it computes the wrong thing. And it's this obviously suboptimal path. And I'm like, oh, okay. So nav meshes aren't the perfect solution that everyone says they are. You can still get the bogus data from them just like you can get from the, the grids from doing grids. So that's why I've always stuck with grids is because there's, it's simpler to stick with grids than to build the nav mesh structure. And, uh, and it's more data to process. So it's going to be slower to pathfind on, but, um, but they all have feelings. So I'm like, ah, whatever. <clears throat> all right. Uh, hey, we need one more. Yeah, yeah. All right. So there was, um, What is the biggest mistake that unexperienced developers do? I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know what inexperienced developers do. I have no answer to that. Okay. Nah. Uh, I don't know. Dun, 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 dun. Not writing good code. <laughs> Are there best practices for how not to get in the way of how highly pipelined or out of order modern CPUs are? Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, their job is to make your C++, your bad C++ code run fast. Um, all modern architectures are like designed to make your dumb shit go fast. So unless you're Fabian, you don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. Like there's like five people in the world who actually give a shit about that stuff. You don't need to be one of them. I, I think it'd be fun. Like it'd be a fun thing to work on, but like, it's just, it's not, if you're writing in a game, it's not practical to worry about that stuff. How do you handle collision physics? If go over every object one by one and affect physics, then one goes before another, then how does the other object know to apply collision physics? How do you deal with this? Um, I understand what question he's asking. I don't know if you do from that. So I do, I do because I'm insane, I decided it would be fun to multi-thread the shit out of everything. So what I do is I um, do a big threaded update that does all the collision stuff, and then I append to a list all of the collisions that happen. And then at the very end of the at the end of the multi-threaded simulation, I pare the list down for when duplicate collisions happen, and then I just go in arbitrary order. So uh, the collisions will happen to two objects at once. Um, but so now, if you resolve collision of two objects and one of them bounces away in a new direction, um, do you just leave it for the rest? And that ha should have happened halfway through the tick. Do you just yeah. leave them in that spot and then yeah. on the next tick, they'll start from there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the one of the things that you can do is to try to make your simulation correct, which is what a lot of people worry about in physics research, is you have to go, well, now that object needs to bounce back in the other direction for half of a tick or whatever. And I've yeah. talked a little bit about that. Um, if you're trying to do variable time step simulation, uh, which is what we all used to do, or a lot of us used to do back in the software rendering days when it was very unpredictable how long your frames took and uh, and every cycle counted and you didn't want to do multiple simulation steps. Um, and you want the game to run about the same no matter how long the tick is. You actually do have to start worrying about that stuff. And on Thief, I'm pretty sure in Thief, we took all the objects, uh, figured out when all the collisions were going to be, and then t put that in a priority queue, took the first one, and resolved that collision and then took that the objects that were involved in that collision and re-collided them against everything else to determine when now their newest collision was. 
and that could change the collision times of other things. Like they could, other things might no longer collide with them and add that to the priority queue and then cycle through the priority queue and do that stuff. Most of the time you have no work to do because you have no collisions. Most of the time you get one collision or most of the remaining time you get one collision and you have to resolve the one collision and none of this matters. So like this system works fine for the kind of game physics we had in Thief. We weren't stacking 5,000 objects where everything's colliding all the time. I mean, one thing is you have to make them not collide all the time. You have to actually... In a real physics, and you need to say they are in contact and they're no longer triggering collisions, then this kind of system becomes viable. But if they're actually constantly triggering collisions, if the way you solve resolve contact is by having everything always colliding and detecting and responding all the time, you know, and microscopically sort of, um, or you know, with a, a implicit buffer around them or something, um, then you uh, that kind of system is probably a bad idea because you're probably going to do a lot of work. I don't, do that work redundantly in games in um but i have talked about how uh, i do sometimes do that kind of thing in 2d games where the character bounces off a wall or whatever i go ahead and like uh you know i'll simulate or i, I think i do this in the obbg player sim when the player bumps against the wall um, and now pushes along the wall i go ahead and simulate what's left of the tick pushing pushing along the wall um and i just it's just like ah uh, you know i might as well um but what I don't do is re-simulate everything else. I just do the the one at a time. Uh, in a lot of games, I just do the one at a time thing. That everything else is frozen. This object moves for the entire. Yeah, game. I do that. I do and, that too. For and, statically. And, and and that's just not correct. But it's not the way it's incorrect doesn't matter. Nobody like the kind of errors you're going to get from that are too subtle to matter. Like if you had two bullets. At going perpendicular and you'd set up their guns perfectly and like they're matched guns and you trigger them both simultaneously so the bullets ought to collide with each other in midair like that case might not work right like that case where you set up that system it's going to move them all independently and they move forward forward far enough in a frame that they just miss each other and i'll miss that case but as long as i don't make a game where you can set that up that experiment up and expect it to work that case it's hard to find places where that case matters at least that was my opinion, especially in 2D games. I'm just like, whatever. Just make it all consistent. Um, yeah, my, my opinion is just whatever, and if it doesn't work, just double the collision frame. Just double your physics step. Like, do it at 120 hertz. Yeah. If that's not good enough, do it at 600 hertz. Like, so just, doesn't the, matter. The kind of case you can run into that I don't handle is like, I bump into this block, which pushes the block, which runs into a wall, and so the block can't move anymore, but I, my character doesn't know he shouldn't move anymore. You know, or you're pushing two things, you know, a chain of things. And I just don't make 2D games where I have chains of things that way, that, where that matters. And when you're writing a real – that's normally what you call writing a real physics sim is trying, starting to worry about those problems of chains of contact uh, and chains of collision. And that's where you normally bring out the big guns. And I'm always like, yeah, if I ever really needed physics in a game, I would get Bullet or one of the other free libraries and try to use it and i probably hate my life because i can't make it work in pc6 but um um you, I, modu- I find that the, sorry i was gonna are you done yeah yeah i'm done go ahead oh, i was gonna say i find that this sort of pattern comes up a lot actually and not just physics simulation but like th- this sort of question of what's the correct way to do it it's like don't do that right like it does like just don't just do the easiest thing possible like literally like you shouldn't ever need that level of physics sim for a game and if you do yeah. double like i said double your you double your physics mm-hmm. tick rate right go 120 hertz 240 hertz go six dyad did physics at 3000 frames per second just because that was the easiest way to do it which is interesting because that's also john blow's proposed solution from writing your game to be future proofed or even today proofed of being able to run at a, on a 120 hertz monitor and a 70 hertz monitor it's like hey like you, the greatest the least common multiple of 70 and 120 is fairly big seven it's 120 times seven um and uh, and of all possible frame rates all monitors might be in the future and really the solution is just run at a high enough simulation step for the whole game simulation not just physics uh, a high enough simulation step that the, f- the fact it doesn't divide perfectly just doesn't matter. It's, you know, as long as you're getting like 10 similar, 
if it should be 10.3 simulation steps, so you end up getting 10 or 11 steps every frame, that's probably not going to be too objectionable. Certainly once you get to 100 versus 101 steps, that's totally, you don't, the fact that your character's movement is slightly varying depending on whether it got the short frame or the long frame just isn't going to matter. I don't know if 10 and 11 is actually large enough, but or, or the, the difference there might be too large, but... Um, yeah, and, so and anyway, if you're doing, that's another advantage to see. You just fucking just multiply, it, do more. And your your yeah. thing's fast enough. Well, and like I said, I have that game where I'm simulating forty thousand. Well, yeah. Why uh, did you do forty thousand? Is I, like, I, did you try doing it with like continuous, like continuous function physics? No, or is it's that just... not. It's, I, it's it's simulating multiple worlds is in a complicated way that I can tell you offline, but I don't want to reveal it uh, to the world. Okay. Uh, but like, so did you did you try a like continuous function no, approach? No, I mean it doesn't. It's not what it's it's not the problem it's trying to solve. Like, imagine oh, if you were okay, trying to okay. simulate. Ma- imagine that what it's actually doing is simulating a thousand worlds at forty frames per second. Oh, okay, okay. Like, there's just no other solution. So, uh, as soon as we stop the stream, I'll tell you before if you have time before you well, go. I, I won't. I know. I'm gonna have to go. Actually, okay. I have to go now. Basically. Well, remind me sometime, and I'll tell you. All right. Well, that, we're done then. Yeah. So. There you go. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll maybe do this again sometime, but not soon. Well, uh, I think. Do we? Agree, or are we going to try proposed, to hold our plan? We proposed monthly, but I'm I'm not going to hold us to it. Like, if in a month we don't feel like doing it, we won't do it. So you know, maybe it'll be a month. We'll see. Okay, sounds good. All right, guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. And this will go up on YouTube for those wondering. I don't. Of course, if you're watching it now. Uh, Yeah, if you missed the beginning, it'll be on YouTube. And you can just go watch the VOD right now. Alright, bye-bye. Bye. See you later.